Hello, everybody. Welcome to the deepest dive on Alan Wake 2, the best, most thorough discussion about the game on the internet. Can we, start, can we restart that? I spilled on myself. <laughs> no. Can we, like, restart Wait, really? that? Do you need to, like, get a sponge? <laughs> I'll just wipe it in. Hold on. There we go. <laughs> I like not wipe it off. I'll wipe it in. Yeah. I'll just rub it into the top. <laughs> Which reminds me, we're joined by Sarah Podorsky. I spilled. <laughs> we're joined by the Jeff Arkeopala. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so Jeff sorry. here as well. Jeff. Uh, it's me, I think. Okay, did you cool. Say, did you say my name? It's so many times. Leo Vader's here. <laughs> and I'm Jeff or? Yeah, yeah. And Haley okay. McLean, otherwise known as Jeff is here. A flawless start. <laughs> this Perfect. is the best, most heard discussion about Alan Wake 2 on the internet. You already know that. You clicked on this thing. This, this is a multi-part game club discussion covering Alan Wake 2. We are talking about, in this discussion, kind of the middle chunk, the chunky middle of Alan Wake 2. So we're talking about everything in this game up through Saga's Chapter 6 and Alan Wake's Chapter 6. So up through those chapters, that is the stopping point, specifically because I know all you out there are sticklers. So we're talking up through uh, Scratch for Saga, that chapter, and then for Alan Wake, of course, the chapter is called Return, which is confusing, but Initiation 6, Return. So... The way this works, this is a huge game club. We are pulling comments from the MinMax community. Everybody who supports MinMax at any tier on Patreon at patreon.com slash minmax with two N's submits their thoughts over there on a regular basis. Uh, this is the second of three chunks of this game club discussion. The final discussion is going to be happening uh, next week. And so this Sunday... Oh, bah, 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 bah. This Sunday, the 19th, we're going to be collecting your comments over on Patreon for everything else in the game, the grand finale of Alan Wake 2. So if you're watching this, thank you, first of all. You can go another layer deeper by subscribing to MinMax's YouTube channel or supporting us at any tier on Patreon so you can submit a comment and we'll read it in the final discussion for the deepest dive on Alan Wake 2. If we have thoughts or if you have thoughts that you're annoyed we aren't saying on this, saying, oh, these people don't know crap about Alan Wake lore, Fix us by going to patreon.com slash minmax with two wins, where you can also unlock the podcast version of all of these discussions, early ad-free versions of the MinMax show, uh, podcast versions of all of our interviews, bonus content in that bonus podcast feed. It's very easy. And this is kind of... Um, this is kind of our whole kit and caboodle. This is uh, our greatest hope is that you watch a video like this and you say, you know what? I think this outlet's worth supporting. I'm going to go check it out just this once. And then you unlock that bonus podcast feed and help support the deepest dive and make it better. Haley, how you doing? Hi. I'm good. This game's rad. It's yeah. Better. This chunk's better than last chunk. Do you all agree? Hmm. Yes. I agree. think so. I feel like I was misled playing that first chunk. Interesting. They wow. definitely, they definitely, it just wasn't as fun. Huh. They really like, they really like made you kind of earn, mm. earn it, earn your Alan Wake musical by like dragging right. you through that awful subway that <laughs> annoyingly easily to get lost in forests. They were like, you will earn the camp, okay? And you have not earned it yet. Right, right. So is it yeah. the gameplay that's clicking for you more now? You're kind of finding more of that groove of a more of a Resident Evil style groove it's that you're used to? so much the gameplay, but I feel like I finally like clicked with the game. Yeah. Like cool. even though I don't know the lore, like I get it. I get like the camp. <laughs> I get that it's like kind of silly. Like I get that it's very like self-aware. But it's like in the beginning, that's not obvious at all. Right. And you have to do a lot of like very normal game stuff where you're like, okay, what is this? How is this different? Where are we shining? And then, yeah, in this next chapter, like they really put it into full gear. Yeah, especially the shining if you catch my drift. Uh, hey, uh, Leo, we like to play a little game called. No, Leo, stay with us. Stay with us, please. We like to play I'm a little trying. game called the Most Common Comment for the Deepest Dive. We have people submit hundreds of comments over there on Patreon. What is the most common comment for the middle of Alan Wake 2? What are people writing in about more than this anything else? Yeah. This is a layup. Who can say? Yeah. Who can say? I mean, that's the thing is I want to go musical, but Sarah, having just mentioned that, I. Maybe the Koskala. Sorry, did I cheapen it? Oh, okay. So you're going with the brothers. I just want to look original in everything I do. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, and everything else is secondary. Hands we'll see down. if that pays off. Jeff, most common comment. What do you think? I have no interest in being original. It was the musical, obviously. Uh -huh. Okay, well, we'll see. <laughs> Haley, what do you think? 
It was the musical. Uh-huh. It's like the best gaming thing I've ever seen. <laughs> the it's best, a musical. The best gaming thing I've ever seen is a I've musical. I've ever seen. Live action musical. I, I have in my notes jaw agape at the musical sequence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sarah, most common comment? I'm going to go with Cynthia's feet. Mm. Mm. I'm going to lock that one, one in. It was the first time ever for The Deepest Dive where I just had to delete just dozens and dozens of comments about the feet because they got too graphic, too detailed, too weird. I said, you guys, the deepest dive. We, did, we, a, have our we did a find and replace in the doc, replace with <laughs> themes. So they're going to sound a lot smaller. <laughs> uh, no, come on, Leo, get original. Uh, the answer is, of course, the We Sing chapter uh, by far. But second place, a lot of people writing in about jump scares. That was yeah. that was closer yeah. than I thought. They uh, went off with those. Boy, did they. Alright, there's a lot to unpack for. <laughs> My little heart is still recovering. I played it till 2 in the morning last night and this spooky meter was off the charts. That one chapter, the saga one, Yeah, Sarah was there with me. That oh was the God. scariest crap ever. That was way scarier than I'll make one times a million. Yeah, old <laughs> gods. You mean just the nursing home stuff? Yes. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. absolutely. So uh, and like, I was really going back and forth on the jump scares too, because I think we talked about it in the first discussion. Like, I don't like them, and especially in this one, I was like, in that old god section, I was like, enough, enough. Like, literally, I was angry at the game. Like, I get it, I get it. Do something else. I get it. Stop doing this to me, please. And then I really 180 hard once I saw you streaming the game, Haley. Um, at <laughs> twitch.tv slash minmax show and I was like you know what the fact that people were so excited to see you play through the jump scare stuff and like Sarah you were like oh I gotta watch her play this thing like mm-hmm. I hate to say it in this in this age in this era like maybe Remedy is smarter than all of us who don't like jump scares and it's like you know what it is fun to watch people get jump scared if they're streaming this game and it's fun to have that big of a reaction even if it does feel like a cheap trick yeah, to put so, a JPEG on so a screen. Five Nights at Freddy's. Like, right. You can right. you can fill a game full of cheap jump scares. And yeah, it's entertaining to watch other people do it. This this section, like, I I got so pissed at at those. I I went on a like overall, I went on a completely emotional journey of ups and downs on this. It ended on a high note, and and of course there were other highs like the musical and stuff, but like I found myself like, like normally in games I don't like I I probably should have mentioned this uh last episode but everyone was was dunking on Sarah for not liking it so I figured I would just leave her to take it but like normally I don't like games when or stories where the main character is a writer who's clearly just a stand in for the person who's writing it like that has that has always annoyed me and it feels very self-referential and it's like you're enjoying writing this a lot more than I am enjoying it as the person, <laughs> you know, consuming it. Like but adaptation like, level stuff? You mean like that type of thing bugs you? Uh, like a what? Like adaptation? The yeah, I, I mean, adaptation is weird for it's That's like its whole own bucket. But like Stephen King does it a lot. And it's okay. like, oh, wow, the pro- protagonist is another, you know, like s- sad sack writer who doesn't have any ideas and like, and that just becomes the idea. And I've, mm-hmm. I've always disliked that. And But, like, it's Alan Wake has been weird for me because I do really like Sam Lake. And I think he's an interesting guy. And so, like, I don't associate those kind of things with Sam Lake. But, but like, it manifests itself in my hatred of Alan Wake. And it's, like, the entire, the entire time I was playing the game, and, and still, this is the one thing that didn't end on a high note, like, I got more and more annoyed with Alan Wake as a character and as a human being to the point where, like, I found myself blaming him for the jump scares. Like, like <laughs> the jump scares would flash and I'd be like, this is the exact kind of cheap shit that Alan Wake would put in a movie adaptation of one of his poorly written horror stories. And it's just like that really ground on me the, in this entire section. Um, and it's. And yeah, it's it's I I fall for him. I'm sure it is entertaining to watch other people jump for him. But it's like, man, figure out how to actually work that into the great atmosphere that you have. Like there were a lot of really cool locations in this section oh my God, yeah. that had me totally creeped out on their own. You don't need to flash up the super cheap faces <laughs> every 30 it seconds. It was weird because I, I feel like they pulled a lot of like horror punches, especially in that like 
beginning water room where you go to turn the lights back on. By the way, you were turning the lights on a lot in this section. Yes. Yep. yep. Saga would walk into a building and they'd be like, mm, silly, the lights are out. Like, better go do something about that. And as much as I love the mind place, little silly to keep going back there to go, okay, and then yes, and here, yes, I need to find a fuse. Right. <laughs> Yeah, Cyrus. Like, the lights on. Okay. Rose told you that. Yeah. 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 Cyrus in the community, they say uh, this is easily one of the most creative games I've ever seen to this point. Uh, and then they start the electricity isn't working. Someone has to fix it in the basement trope. I'm not a fan of that decision. I think it would count as a horror game already without that. But that is a wild thing because it's like, oh my god, this game's so awesome. Oh my god, this rocks. This rocks. And it's like, but we just need a fuse. It's like, oh, okay, sure. I, I only understand. I had a fuse to turn the lights on. <laughs> I will say, by the end of the Cynthia section, I was no longer like I was still getting jump scared but by the end of it I was just like in a rage like I was like I will find Cynthia I will throttle her I don't care that it's elder abuse I will take her down I was so sick of like just seeing her everywhere like she got me every time yep. with that jump scare yep, yep, by the yep. end of it I wasn't even scared it was just it was a revenge killing at yeah. that point <laughs> I like that idea Jeff of blaming Alan Wake for the jump scares because I do think there's kind of this building tension throughout this chunk of the game as well of like every time you're playing a saga it's just like come on alan like every time you talk to him it's just like everything is confused and it feels like he's so behind the eight ball she's just like wait you're still in the darkness no you're out like what are you talking just he's trying to catch up to where she's at it's just like this frustrating feeling of like i can't even understand what you're talking about i'm five steps ahead of you mr alan wake but a lot of people wrote in about this uh this basic idea um Bo, wrote in saying with each new draft Alan creates, he says he needs a new murder scene. Are the three victims saga is solving at the start, a consequence to Alan's failed drafts. Maybe I think it's interesting that we've got confirmation in this part that saga did exist before. And now it's just Alan is, is changing things. So it's, it's unclear what was around before because clearly a lot of it was right. Right. Uh, Mighty Ethan writes in, they say, what do y'all think of Alan in this game? We love him. Um, he's trying no, to get himself... I think he needs to be stopped. <laughs> he needs to stop this... writing boo in the middle he of his book. Stop! So stop. <laughs> what would be the consequence of just stopping? So this man needs to answer, like, this. he needs consequences. Okay, well, like, when he gets out of the dark place, consequences. <laughs> I feel like his entire Probably life has been consequences. Dark place. Like, That's <laughs> what I was saying! Would it be so wrong Leave us to out of stay it. there? Right. Well, Scratch yeah. will keep writing. <laughs> He's got to keep giving notes to Scratch. Come on, Scratchy boy. Does he? Uh, so uh, Mighty Ethan says he's trying to get himself out of the dark place by writing a horror story in which many people are turned into dark monsters, killed or otherwise traumatized. I understand he has to follow the laws of drama and can't make everything sunshine and rainbows or it won't work. But is the cost worth it? In the first game is one thing because the darkness was already out and he was trying to save the world. But in this one, he's trying to save himself and he's sacrificing a lot of people to accomplish it. Is uh, is Alan the, the baddie? I think that's in there. That's not an unfair read of of him and yeah. what's going on. Yeah. But also, it's like yeah. I don't know how did he, how would he stop if he stops? Scratch keeps going. If he kills himself, he just wakes up again later because he keeps dying and he keeps not really dying. You know. <laughs> but is the dark presence not trying to get out through other people now? Like regardless of Alan too. Like you know, it's like Nightingale. Was did Alan write Nightingale coming out of the woods and getting killed, or did that just happen because the dark presence like? was trying to use Nightingale to get out again because it's just trying to get out again over and over. It's like he tried with Barbara, didn't work, tried Mm. with Alan, it didn't work. So it's just like it doesn't have to be Alan. I think it could just be someone who's dumb in the lake (laughs) like you again. But but like the writing thing seems to work well. So it's a lot. It latches onto writers for some like like Thomas Zane and now Alan. And maybe he thinks he has a better chance of stopping it because he knows how to work with it, with writing within its genre. The what his kind of monologue about that, about like I know what I have to do. I need to keep it within these parameters. I can't change it yeah. too much. Like and he might have some kind before. of hero. Yeah, he might have some kind of hero complex around like I have a better he, shot of stopping the dark presence mm-hmm. than anybody else. He right. definitely seems to have a hero complex, and it's also <laughs> it's also funny that it's like, well, I have to write I have to write the story to you know to save everything and get everything out. So I'm going to write, okay, so there's a cult in here and it's called the cult of the word. And they're obsessed with a writer named Alan Wake (laughs) and they hang on every word that he writes and thinks he's the most interesting and amazing person on the planet, but they're out to get me now. And it's like, come on, dude. Like you are so self-absorbed. And I'm just, I'm just glad that like those feelings 
don't extend to Remedy and Sam Lake in my mind for whatever reason. Like mm. I like as as soon as I saw him Sam Lake dancing around, I was like, well, this is the best thing ever, and I'm, <laughs> I'm just gonna sit here and enjoy this, even though like mm. those those two things are. And then and then Alan Wake's stupid face will come up and be like, oh, that Alan Wake, you're so <laughs> full of yourself, and it's just like. Whatever, man. Whatever, whatever divider I have in my brain uh, is at least working in Sam Lake's favor on this. Right. Subject permanence, right? Yeah, and, <laughs> yeah. So is is he self absorbed, or is it Scratch that self absorbed that in writing it? Then maybe Alan's See, trying to frantically edit like, it to make him uh, involving less of himself. People keep being like, "Oh, it's not Alan's fault. It's Scratch's fault." But right. can't we believe that like Scratch is a part of Alan? Like everyone's like, "Oh, he's the demon. He's the devil." But like. Couldn't it just be like a writer's unchecked ego sort of like slipping yeah. out a little That's bit? That's what Scratch is. Scratch is everything that people don't like about Alan, like as a thing. And the Dark Presence like uses that to just like troll Alan, I guess. But like, <laughs> like what's the worst parts of Alan? And that's what Scratch is. And then he just like goes out in the world and causes but, like, havoc. Why does Scratch keep torturing Alice? Like this is something I can't, like how does Scratch have the free time of being evil <laughs> to go stand in Alice's hallway? Like we still haven't really figured that out yet. Like who has the time? I guess he's not fully out. Like, he, he wants to be able to do whatever he wants, but all he can do is spook Alice a bunch in the hallway. Yeah. Like, that's his Thursday night. He's like, ah, I wish I could Gotta destroy give humanity, but do. I'll just, bah, Alice. Like, that's all he could do. Is your read, Haley, um, being the deepest into the lore of all this stuff, is your read that the Alan Wake that was on the beach that we encountered in the last chunk, that's like, all right, yeah. now you're out. Way to go. That that was Scratch being like, Tee-hee-hee, it's me secretly the whole yeah. time or is it a matter of kind of like a dr jekyll and mr hyde thing because that's the impression i kind of had like in the prison that like alan wake is still alan wake but then he's shifting into scratch as like a a, a monster thing that he can't control because i mean we control yeah. alan wake in this chunk and you know he's all bloody he's like oh what happened like it does it doesn't feel like it's just as clean as that was scratch the whole time it feels more like it's he's jumping back and forth between personalities yeah at the end of one of the DLCs, there's a moment where he's standing in front of himself and himself on the ground is like, it's like scared Alan. They, I think people call him irrational Alan because the whole DLC is about him like trying to reach his irrational self that's just scared. Like it's just the primal instinct of I'm really frightened. Where's my mommy? And he's trying to like get over that feeling to do what he needs to do. And that's like the point of the DLC is like trying to get to irrational Alan. And at the end, he fuses with irrational Alan and then he keeps writing. And that's when he starts writing Return and that Return shows up on the, on the, um, typewriter and then we don't hear anything until Alan Wake 2 right so it's like or I guess maybe American Nightmare came after that but people try I've seen people argue that that was him fusing with Scratch in that moment like and but I think it's irrational Alan I don't know I can see why you'd think that because he's in the cell and he's like panicking he's like you don't get it he's right here yeah Ah!" and then like he slicks his hair back looks 10 times hotter and is Scratch (laughs) and you're like oh okay (laughs) (laughs) I guess it's Scratch now but I I really don't think that maybe he can just possess him because it's not like he's a body. He's not a mass, right? He's not like walking like he can walk around and do things, but he can also like the dark presence isn't just scratch. Like the dark presence is like a a ethereal thing. Like that's Mm -hmm. always the scariest thing. And that was like the first thing they said. And like the first Alan Wake is like, it's scarier not to know what's happening than to like be like, that's the enemy, the Demogorgon in Stranger Things, <laughs> yes, done, right. and like check the box. It's way scary to be like, what are the rules? And like lately, mm-hmm. I haven't really been writing notes about like that much stuff. It's mainly just like, what are the rules of the dark place and dark presence? Because they give you little, little pieces every like hour they'll say something like it works in loops and rituals and i'm like frantically writing that down scribbling out that's the only yeah, scratching it out that's the only way they give you that lore is through these really quick like either it's a manuscript or alan like realizing something or even saga sometimes like because she's smarter than alan like let's be real like she'll figure things out herself too and once we know the rules, then we can come to conclusions. But I feel like I know t- like four out of a hundred rules, so I can't really like figure <laughs> out anything yet. But that's the point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the yeah. one, uh, the Juan one over there on Patreon, they submitted a comment saying, "Mr. Scratch has a totally different presence and personality in this game than he had in Alan Wake's American Nightmare. In American Nightmare, the tone and story were Pulp Fiction. So Mr. Scratch matches that with his character being a Mr. Blonde or Vega type character. He seduces women, kidnaps victims, kills them in front of Alan Wake through the TV and parts of that game, taunting Wake throughout the adventure that he's going to live a better life than he ever did and will kill Alice when he gets out. He even showed Alan the weapons he used to kill his victim." 
victim, noting he hates guns as they're not personal. Wake stopped him in American Nightmare, but I think this confirmed Haley's theory that American Nightmare was one of Wake's attempts to get out of the dark place, as that game works as a time loop as well. While in Alan Wake 2, he's the silent killer type, like Jason Voorhees or Michael Myers, which matched the story as this is a horror book slash movie. Sorry for being a nerd for another second, but Scratch's main theme in that game was the happy song Poets of the Fall. The same theme plays when Wake and Zane were drinking, going on drugs, and writing, which raises red flags for me. So maybe Zane equals Scratch or Scratch equals Wake. That's a lot of... And then of, uh, Z- Zane happens to look just like Alan, too. Like, right. Like, without a beard. <laughs> could not believe the difference between Zane and Alan. Like, I was like, I couldn't believe they were the same person. Wait, really? Because of the beard. Yeah, I literally, oh, wow. like, I did not believe they were the same person at first. And I was like, who knew a beard could be so magical? <laughs> Ask <him> Jeff. <laughs> what a moment. <laughs> right. Uh, okay, should we try and uh, work our way chron- uh, chronologically through this, even though it's kind of confusing because you can jump through a bunch of other things, but there's so many great comments from people. But uh, let's start with sagas. I did the bulk of saga stuff first. I don't know about the, the rest of y'all. I alternated. I couldn't find I the freaking yeah, bucket sometimes, so I just yeah. kept going with whoever I was with. It's weird how not every save room has a bucket. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, it is a weird feeling. I didn't feeling. like that. Yeah, I it, guess it's it is, silly to, to put it, one in every save room, but it is weird. It, mm. Yeah, it's it's a weird it's a weird mechanism because I was at, at one point I was like in the um, running around in the police headquarters, and it's like well, I want to go to Saga now, and I guess I just have to leave and like run across town back to the hotel in order to just like switch over to her. I I wish I wish it was they just had a bucket in the mine place that you could. Mm, use yeah. to switch between them but yeah i do kind of and maybe this is just making excuses but i kind of like the weird physicality of the thing like it makes you care about the switch a lot more even if it's you know just playing spider-man 2 where it's like i oh, just go ahead and hot swap uh, all over the the open world like there's something kind of cool about it being constrained in a way of like i need to go see Ati's bucket in order to switch and it's kind of a funky feeling to finish a chapter and be like all right I'm ready to switch now, but it's like, no, 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 you're still running. And also, it's just, it kind of reminds me of just kind of the funky structure of this, where, like, you'll finish a chapter, and then sometimes it's a little while before, like, the next chapter will boot up and actually put the title screen on the on the screen. And it's just, like, a weird state of limbo of, like, is this, what am I supposed to be doing? I guess this is kind of just the explore time, but it kind of just adds to a, a really unique feel to the game overall, limiting it in these ways, you know? Mm. Um, but uh, Saga, Return 3, Local Girl. Heading to Watery, uh, it's Washington's Little Finland, uh, is what they really like to, to let you know about. Uh, wandering around the town, seeing Ati just belt it out with that karaoke song, which I feel like is in so much of this entire chapter then, is him just letting it rip. Unbelievably good song. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I stood, sat there and listened to it, and I was like, oh, oh, I see. Okay, I've been here a few minutes. It's looping now. It's just looping. <laughs> it's looping. And then kept listening to it for like another full cycle. It's the kind of loop and overlap. I don't want to leave. Yeah, uh, They say it loops forever. Uh, the cycle I leave you on every time. Bo writes in, forever. says, uh, as an owner of a cleaning service, I may be biased, but Ati's the best. He's so weird and he seems to have a key to everywhere. He's a walking overlap. Also, he's a lovely singer. Uh, yeah, there's, there's Ati's no the goat. Doubt. Every time I see Ati, my heart calms down a little bit. He's very much like Uncle Ati, and you're like, oh, I'm okay for a minute. Except like, for that one part area. in Valhalla where yes. he jump scares you. Yes, yes. that is yeah. unforgivable. That was we were not on the same side then. <laughs> True. Well, to be fair, you were trying to get in his room, and he was like, what are you doing? Stop. Well, like was that there. his room? The one with like the spiral yeah, out, like the ocean view thing? Yeah. No, okay. I thought that his room was on the right. So yeah, I, thought, I, I don't think, think it I was. ever got into the spiral room. Yeah, I don't think you can go in. So Kevin, oh, no, yeah. Kevin W. That's writes a, in, they say, everyone else, or did anyone else go to the top floor of the retirement home and try to open the door with a spiral on it? I nearly jumped out of my skin when Ati appeared behind Saga to tell her that getting in is forbidden for your own safety. This was a much better jump scare than the black and white flashes of, streaming, of screaming, which are getting tiresome and repetitive. I wasn't able to play far enough to discover the significance of this room, but the incident confirms that Ati is always watching, and I can't tell if it's a good thing or not. Uh, yeah, I, I went and talked to him and then did that. And like he, him getting there impossibly fast when I knew where he was yeah. was really effective. Yeah, yeah. And also, yeah, it is. It's weird with the jump scares and, you know, these types of scares too, of just like some things are just so scary compared to other things. Like 
70% of the jump scares do zero for me, and then 30% give me a heart attack. And I'm still trying to figure out oh, that distinction, but it's so weird that, ratio, like... ratio, though. I, I can live with that ratio, hopefully, unless the heart attacks are too yeah. bad. But, like, the Ati jump scare, like, that one got me in such a big way, and I'm trying to think of... It's just something about, like, thinking you understand the space when you don't. Like, is that the, the alarm in my heart that goes and, off? And, like, you thinking you understand the rules of, like... yeah. Characters did, haven't done that, <laughs> and they aren't going to do that again. Different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I had a remedy moment that Sarah would have loved during that scary part. Going back to where, because we're near Ati's room, where I'm jumping ahead, but creeping up to Cynthia's room, finally ready to open it, I go check out Ati. He's a posing with his <laughs> legs stuck in the couch oh, in the mattress. And I'm like, oh my, are, are they getting this meta with it? Wow, that's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> and then he Did jumps again, back to Remedy. <laughs> You've done it again. Yeah, I fell through the world. I had a couple bugs this time that I like fell through the world. Like whenever I tried oh, no. to like proceed to an area too fast, my body would just keep falling. And I was like looking up at the world, like floating away. And I was just like, really? Sam Lake, you've done it again. <laughs> As I'm like floating into the abyss. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, um, I'm playing on Xbox. And I, I want to say, maybe I didn't notice it as much. Maybe it just course corrected or maybe they patched it. But like for the first couple days, at least playing this chunk, like the audio was still out of sync for cutscenes, And it, Oh no. Oof, man, it really has an impact. It really bothered me okay. and, and lowered my impact and just enjoyment of the game for, for that chunk. But hopefully, yeah, the stuttering audio la that I last time I said wasn't a big deal. This time, the end of the musical segment is in a cutscene, a loading screen cutscene that gets the stuttered audio. Oh, that's ah! rough. For the, so rough. the dancing was off. That was unforgivable. Yeah, that seems unforgivable. Um, Fred DeNovo writes in over there on Patreon. Thanks for your support, Fred. They say, uh, Sarah, cover your ears. Just. You can cover them or you can pour two drinks over them really quickly and it'll muffle it, I think. Um, did anyone else notice the detail on... <laughs> did anyone else notice the detail on Norman's legs outside the sauna in Watery? His legs oh, are discolored to show he isn't getting the correct blood flow and part of the reason that he needs those crutches. What a specific detail. Oh, wow. I didn't notice oh. that. <laughs> I was uh, very happy to see uh, the sauna sitting over there by the water. And just the old guys in the towels ready to go. It's it's a cool little I had people little in detail. my chat being like, it's the towel Ben talked about. I was like, what? <laughs> oh, <laughs> because we have a, the way this works uh, for everybody watching YouTube is we have literally just like a, a Google Doc over there on Patreon that everybody adds their comments to. So I wanted to get the ball rolling and show them the format. So I just said, I don't know, what's a stupid oh. comment that no one would ever comment about? I said, I like <laughs> Norman's towel. <laughs> so that's what they were talking about. I'm not actually was, obsessed with the towel, you guys. I was guys. wondering if you tweeted about it or something. Like, how did they get this take from him? I don't know. <laughs> writing this anywhere. Yeah, I made a video essay on Midmex's YouTube channel. If you saw it, it's all just about Norman's towel. Uh, let's see. Um, the Speaking of sauna and at the start of Saga's section here, sauna. did you guys eavesdrop on the two people at the, the outdoor sauna and watery? No. I assume I did. I, I don't remember I what they did. talked about, but... What did I hung out over there for a bit. It's one of the funniest meta gags in this game which is one of the people at the sauna wants to have a conversation and the other one does not is not interested in having an npc conversation but one <laughs> guy keeps saying generic lines and the other one keeps trying to get him to shut up for example they say a sauna is good to fix what ails ya they also say silence is golden <laughs> <laughs> and that's the end of it and there's so many barks from them like that it's really funny Oh, that's like fun. one is an NPC and one is a real person. That's so yeah, funny. right. I like I forget who it is, but there's somebody that you profile as Saga in this chunk too, where they're going back and forth and debating puzzles. Like everyone hates puzzles. Like no, what are you talking about? Puzzles are great. Oh, like, isn't it Yako and Ilmo? I think so. When you're like, trying to get into the, they're like. I don't know, locked vault. They're like, everybody likes puzzles. Right, yeah, I like they have a line where they're like, you have to be a really smart person to design puzzles. Everybody loves them. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, okay, I guess that's right. Uh, let's see, uh, they didn't leave a name, so I'm assuming it's uh, Mr. Scratch, but they say, I became obsessed with Pat Main's radio show in this chapter. When it came on, I as I walked by a new area, I stopped and listened immediately. His spiraling insistence that Wendy Davis, confirmed dead on the case board, from Davis family beef jerky, confirmed by her widower that has never existed, is alive and well despite repeated callers telling him that she's dead. It might weirdly be the most chilling part of the game so far for me. It's yeah. insanely depressing, yeah. And I was laughing because there was one point where, I think it was one when you're in a 
gondola or not a gondola a gazebo and he's trying to plug the jerky and but the guest won't let him like get it out and so he keeps <laughs> trying to replug i was like this is ben when he's trying to do the plugs and we keep interrupting him and then it kind of escalated to <laughs> pat made his ben and when he's 90 <laughs> oh like, i can yeah, live with that about. that seems like a he had a life. setup in his retirement home he yeah. had good stuff he had lots of mics little dials and he that's was true. doing a show it's like there's ben i do think that's i mean a sign of just kind of the confidence we have in remedy at this point in this game is like when i first heard that pet main radio show it's a matter of like this is going to be important i should stop and listen to all these and then to have just like that little payoff of like oh you encounter him in the old folks home and you get to actually see his equipment and it was interact like meeting with them. a celebrity at that point <laughs> also when i met elmo and yako i was like oh my god i love your commercials <laughs> well problematic fan. saves elmo and yako <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> Pat Bain has a show in the whole first Alan Wake as well. Like, oh, really? A video show that you can listen to, yeah. But he's not, uh, he doesn't have dementia and or is, t- you know, been possessed potentially. Like, it's, they're very unclear about why he's confused. It might just be he's old or it could be that something nefarious is happening. And I kind of like that I don't know. He could just be an old man. He's a bit confused. And this is Wendy. Like, and he's sad about it. And, it's, and people are swearing at him on his radio show live on air instead of just <laughs> calling him the phone instead of talking to him on the radio oh my god yeah <laughs> it's kind of the fun thing with this game is like just having multiple ways to interpret almost everything like even interacting yeah. with rose in the old folks home chapter it's like are you just lying trying to derail what i'm doing here or did you really not see tor come out of that water you know like there's so many situations like that of like i'm reading the face just to try and figure out like is this the narrative within the world twisting or are you just straight up a liar and this is just a real human to human interaction it's tough to tell at times right yeah where she got left after the first one because she gets possessed by the t- like by the dark presence in the first game so it's kind of like is she still messed up from that question mark or is rose just weird <laughs> like you right. kind of don't know <laughs> yeah uh, we can get to rose uh in a bit for sure but uh yeah this is whole chunk all right you're making your way to the trailer uh, you run into Ilmo talking to you about your daughter and all that stuff. And it's the classic thing now of Saga being like, oh, it's like they remember a different reality. But I guess I can go to my trailer. Let's see how it goes. Um, even I have to navigate through Coffee World to get there. The scariest yes. abandoned amusement park in the middle of the woods. But also like not abandoned because it clearly yeah, it's, is it's running. It's supposed to be but, open. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're like, we're going to open it soon. And I'm like, it looks like it was opened and then closed and now you're opening it again? Right, right. The rides are running and you hear children screams as you approach. But yeah. then there's no children there when you get there. Yeah, I hated that. But then I love too. That know, was like, awesome. When you're coming up on it and there's like that body of water and there's just like those little like water rides, but they're kind of like scattered all over the lake. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, I don't know. Everything's just in slight disrepair as you're going into this thing. It's um, so real. Like that's so real small town. There's a place called Upper Clements Park in my province that's now like looks like that like it's been abandoned oh, five years ago excellent. and people sneak there and like record videos and take pictures and stuff but i went there not that long ago it feels like in my brain it functioned perfectly it was busy and now it's you're gonna tell me it looks like the last of us it's like not even been that long <laughs> but that's what it looks like there's grass growing over the roller coaster and the bumper cars are like rotting to the ground and i'm like how wow. it's been like two it's been two weeks i feel like but it's, <laughs> it's decrepit so they like nailed that feeling of like if something doesn't get attention and care, aka watery, like yeah. they're losing all their tourism, things just deteriorate so fast. Yeah. And Pliskin makes a good point that Ilmo and Yako even make a call to the workers so you can pick up the key. But now, knowing what we know now, who knows if they're really talking to anyone? Yeah. Or do you hear mm-hmm. them on the phone? I don't remember. Yeah, I forget exactly. But uh, <laughs> yeah, the amusement park, it, it made me think of, it's a very specific thing, and I'm sure I'm connecting these two, two things that aren't connected. But when we visited Remedy... Back at Game Informer, Sarah, um, for a cover story trip, Sarah, at Game Informer? I don't know what that is. Oh, sorry. Um, but we visited Remedy for the Quantum Break cover story. We had like a free day Lucky. at the end uh, where Ben Reeves and I went to an amusement park, like an old Finnish amusement park that was pretty close to Remedy. It wasn't that far. And so I'm wondering, it's like amusement park, <gasps> amusement park. Inspired? But like it was super old and they had just a bunch of cool old stuff like all right here's kind of our uh, equivalent of it's a small world but just a bunch of old finnish witches like ah but then they had like an, a roller coaster that was so old that it didn't have brakes like literally 
the way it would work is there had to be a brakeman riding on the back of it, and he had to like manually with a pedal slow down at the right sections of the roller coaster for this <laughs> old wooden thing. Absolutely not. It was freaking not. cool. Wow. It was awesome. Had to put his feet through the boards like Spider-Man 2. <laughs> 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 we believe in you, man, as the boards are flying up, I see. Uh, Garrett Hullfish writes in and says, I love the absurdity of Coffee World, but $25 for adult admission? That's robbery, especially with half the rides out of commission. <laughs> and also it's know. called Coffee World, but the only bathrooms are porta potties. Yeah. <laughs> like it's Coffee World. Like I want some luxury bathrooms at Coffee World. Help us out, I see. please. Because that's a part of the coffee experience. It's a part of the experience. That's yeah. right. Uh, yeah, David Dillinger says every single porta potty was out of order in Coffee World. <laughs> I had a good laugh when I found a note stuck on it where a visitor wrote, You gotta get your shit together. <laughs> really, that was the scariest part of Coffee World in general, which is the bathroom situation. <laughs> Such an awesome theme for an amusement park. Yeah. I mean, that's an overall theme, I think, for for this entire section. And Jeff, and we already alluded to it. But just like I realized just that idea of having abandoned Coffee World Amusement Park back to back for the way I was playing it with like, you know, Scandinavian God old folks homes. Like just those two environments back to back. And then obviously getting to the musical sequence. Like, God, just awesome environments. You know, early on in this game's development when they had that up on a whiteboard, it's like, all right. This is a cool idea. This is a cool idea. Like just good ideas for levels. I think like the chapter framing of how this game is constructed. Like I wonder like if that helps them be more creative. I don't. There, this is maybe uh, too much out on a limb. But like I remember reading about in an Awada ass like the making of Donkey Kong Country Returns, and they had every level up on a whiteboard in Retro Studios, and they would communally like give it a. Uh, a grade it's like alright this level's at a C right now we're not going to stop till every level's at an A and there's something about like a chapter format for a game where I wonder if it kind of has the same effect of like alright we need every chapter to be unique it's such a distinct thing it's more clear than just like this quest line in this open world game versus this quest line you know it's like no chapter 5 needs to be awesome chapter 6 needs to be different and awesome you know like is that a weird thought am I up my own butt no, that makes total sense to oh. me. It's like so much easier to edit a thing than the whole thing. <laughs> yes, know? Like I guess that's it. If it's sectioned up, then it's like, what's wrong with just this mm. section? The other ones are fine. Yep. And it's so much easier to oh. rationalize and think about it. And I do wonder, if this game being made in only three years, supposedly. That's crazy. It, it feels like they must have a really good hold on how to make a game at this point. <laughs> and I, something that's that struck me on this note was when you're as Alan doing the sections here, it was at the hotel with the cult play where you are putting plot elements into different scenes. Yeah. It's like, there's only room for four on the board. There's only ever going to be four. And it feels like establishing something like that or with the, the janitor's buckets only being in certain save rooms. It's like putting these kind of limiters on it. So we don't get Mm -hmm. too carried away. Keeping the scope like manageable. Having those like boundaries early on. That's why I wasn't upset when people are like, the NPCs don't really talk to me, whatever. It's wasted. Like there's so much better stuff they can focus their attention on than like the NPCs having like weird conversations with you. Yeah. The fact that they couldn't make the first one an open world game is probably the best thing that happened to the series. Like (laughs) it made it, it might've sucked at the the time. It's like, Oh, we had such a crazy vision, but this game needs to be linear. It would not hit Mm -hmm. the same at all. If it was not a linear game. I'm so point. grateful there's no side quests. Like I didn't realize it till halfway through, but like not having random stuff pulling me in different directions as someone who's been like playing a lot of games this year, a lot of tri- like AAA games, it just feels so good to not have to do a side quest. Like everything <laughs> right. is main story. You can go off the trail if you want, but like it's not gonna like drive you into this some weird thing that doesn't really relate to the main story. It just feels good to play a streamlined experience. Yeah, but still mm-hmm. having, yeah, those pockets of like, well explore the area now that's not flooded anymore if you want to and there's collectibles everywhere you get the idea you're going to find some cool stuff but it's not a matter of like the collectibles are rich enough that they're on the case board and there's like what am I learning about how these collectibles are here like giving them that extra depth almost makes them replace side quests but is is anybody else kind of just as rich or richer I always feel like, okay, if I'm going through that case board stuff, it's like, all right, the collectibles, I'll let those stack up for a bit before I'm going there and pinning, like, found another little chest over here. It's like, There's yeah. some fun little spunky stories with the doll puzzles, though. Like, <laughs> right. some very much sought, like, like, in control, how you learn about all these wacky things that have happened behind the scenes that could be their own episode of a TV show. Like, the little puzzles, like, I stumbled across one that was just... 
a woman who married a bear. <laughs> And, and then you had to like reenact that with the dolls. And then when <laughs> reality switched, the bear had killed her and there was blood everywhere. And you're like, oh no, that's really sad. But there was just like pictures of her with the bear on their wedding day. And it was called, the checks and was called Beauty and the Beast. Wasn't there like flowers on the bed too? Yeah, the like, bear in, like, was like a little the heart formation. <laughs> I choose to or, believe this was a Baldur's Gate 3 reference that they added at the very last minute. Mm. Definitely, they said delay the entire game. <laughs> That bear was why wedding. they delayed it by a week so they could slip in that Baldur's yeah. Gate reference. Yeah, there's no I also doubt. like how my thought is the bear did the heart and not her, but it was definitely her and she invited the bear in. No, and no, 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 I like no, to no, think no, that no. the bear walked in and was like, she's going to love this and scattered <laughs> it. And then his bloodlust took over him halfway through, maybe. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, I like the, uh, you mentioned the, the clothespin thing. I like the, the first one you find, Saga's like, oh, a little clothespin doll. Perfect weird souvenir for Logan. It's like, no, that's a terrifying toy for a kid. What are you doing? You're going to give your kid nightmares for ever if you hand that thing to her don't do it please and she keeps she keeps collecting them even though like her daughter's kind of dead now <laughs> like, what i guess okay i guess my daughter's kind of dead now i guess is where it's at. um <laughs> yeah i like that the walk to coffee world to like you know you basically run into quicksilver in the woods except he's throwing those axes at you i hate that enemy yeah Somebody those were was, boss enemies in Alan Wake One. They're just hanging out in the woods. In oh this one. yeah, like <laughs> that was like a big fight. Like oh no, he's speedy, and now they're just like, "Yep, what about it?" And <laughs> you just have to run away half the time with those guys. Somebody yeah, pointed out, I forget where it is. Oh yeah, um, uh, Scott S pointed out that uh, the Taken they dashed around like Jesse Faden did in Control. It's like mm -hmm. I guess I hadn't thought Ooh. of that connection, but that's an interesting idea of like I guess it's just kind of a dash, you know. Maybe we're connecting too many dots here, but um, be Scott, very utilitarian or whatever. Yeah, On this section, this is where you get the crossbow too, which deepest dive detail. I don't know if anybody wrote in about this, but the yeah. reload animation on that crossbow is so good. It is. I have she a... bends down and pulls the thing back, and while she's doing it, she's like glancing up ahead Ooh. of her, so clear. which works when she's alone and afraid somebody might be there, or when you're in the middle of combat. It looks like so perfect and and in the world. Hey, and when yeah. you upgrade it to have two, she like balances both. Sometimes a little clumsily when she's like putting them in two at a time. Cool. Is it? I've collected so many bolts and I somehow missed this crossbow and it's killing me because oh, no. if you remember really? the deepest have an Wait, RE4, I love the crossbow. It? I know, I love the crossbow. Um, I don't know. I need to go back and find it apparently. I hope this it still has it. stream when bolts. you play. They so uh, tell you where things are. Everybody can scream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want them to see me mm -hmm. freak out though at the jump scares, so I can't possibly do that, Sarah. <laughs> um, Empiric Unicorn says. Yeah, the only problem with the jump scares is my throat hurts from screaming at every single one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to lose my voice again, you guys. Empiric Unicorn writes in and says, Don't sleep on the crossbow. Taken, taking down Taken with headshots feels empowering and it's nice that you can recycle the ammo. Plus, the upgrades mm -hmm. are fun. Does sound great. Uh, we really got into the upgrades it. this section. There's some yeah. cool upgrades. The crossbow has one where if you hit them with it, it like will magnetize your bullets to where the bolt hit them. Yeah. What? You can yeah. get away with missing a little bit after you hit them with one crossbow. They go like schwung and they like go aim towards the, the bolt. You shot. That's a really cool idea. Yeah. Uh, Ampex writes in and says, the crossbow is such a good addition uh, to this game for me, not because of how effective it was as a weapon or its ammo economy, but because of how it made me feel. Shooting someone and then taking what feels like an eternity to reload another arrow while an enemy is running towards me made my heart rate spike every time. How stressful it felt while also being so cinematic and satisfying is one of the best feelings I've had in survival horror combat in general. Let's, yeah, let's talk more about the combat because I think it's not like groundbreaking, but it's also not average. I've had some really cool moments. Just in like... Juggling two enemies with the rifle, I found myself counting the bullets I had fired because it doesn't show that on screen like in every mm. other game. So you're really like, okay, I have one left. I really have to make this count. And I have the upgrade for the rifle where if you stand still for after a second, the crosshair zooms in. It does a cool sound effect. Yes. And then it has an extra powerful shot or whatever. So knowing I'm on the last bullet of the clip, dodging the axe and taking the extra second to get that boost of damage because it's the last most important bullet and hitting him with it. Really great moments in the in the combat. Nothing's worse like, in this or RE4 than when someone's throwing an axe at you and it's like, I'll dodge it? No, I just walked into it. Okay, thanks a lot. You dodge into it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. It's over and over and over, over again. Every time. <laughs> uh, one biology writes in about that too, saying, did anyone else buy the rifle focus upgrade? I usually forgot I had it unlocked and the sound effect from it is so loud and dramatic, along with the extra zoom and screen effect, I kept getting jump scared 
worse from that worse from that than the dark presence plus yeah. if you're in town and you have it put away but it was the last weapon equipped the effect will still trigger if you try to zoom in on something like a wall or a desk or something like that wow remedy that's genius <laughs> <laughs> did it again. Uh, but Scott S is with you, Leo. They say, I began to feel powerful during Saga's chapter four. Switching between the crossbow, handgun, and my upgraded shotgun, depending on the rage, it really felt good. Uh, don't get me wrong, the axes whizzing past my head and the muttering taken dashing around like Jesse Faden, there we go, still freaked me out, but it didn't feel like running away. I got the, quote, in one go trophy, which is the crossbow headshot on the guy who pops up in the middle of the percolator ride, which was very satisfying. That's when I got nice. that, too, I think. Really? Oh, yeah. Funny. Is that one guy riding in that middle weird thing? <laughs> My confidence with it is definitely building in this section. Like, knowing how much the melee attack does, knowing, you know, getting a handle on the positioning of enemies and how they move. There have been times where I'm like, okay, I'm going to dash in and bring the fight to them instead of just constantly dodging, terrified the whole time. Just dash in and whack them to stun them and then hit them with the follow-up shot. Dash and whack. I'm finding the depth. I'm you finding the depth. Uh, I like that Alan is way weaker than Saga, too. Like, it feels different to be Alan than Saga. Like, when he just has his little six, only six bullets in his chamber. <laughs> he didn't have two guns until forever. Like, it took forever to get the shotgun in the hotel. Meanwhile, Saga's got, like, five guns, can reload as much as she wants, has, like, 18 bullets in her chamber now. It's yeah. like, oh, no. Like, I have the pump action shotgun on Saga now. It's like, see, uh, like, I just run right up to him and, like, <laughs> Like, see, done. You know, not not even scared anymore. Yeah. But with Alan, I'm like peeking out of the the safe room and like shooting twice, and then going back in the safe room and trying to cheese it because he's so much wimpier. That shotgun <laughs> is awesome. Like for how far the enemies fly back when you hit them, it's really satisfying. Yeah, it's huge. Flares are really satisfying too. Have you guys started using those? I, I didn't use them at all until I like, saw yeah. Haley in the stream use one for the first time where it's like I've only been using them for like that last ditch like ah, shove it in your mouth as it's coming towards you or whatever mm -hmm. but I haven't like yeah. popped one and Haley it seemed like it was really good and effective and I should be doing it they don't tell you that you can chuck them on the ground and then they're all kind of like ah, and then mm. you can just be like and just like blow them away while they're all focusing on the flare on the ground I don't yeah. I don't like the propane tanks I think they're pretty bad like i tried to use them a few times and they didn't do what i want so i just put them in the shoebox yeah and didn't even try again i feel like i'm already the, uh, always losing where they are like all right i threw it now where is that thing like in this boss fight okay i lost i don't yeah. have time to focus they just on this dash thing. away from it immediately and i'm like okay cool <laughs> right <laughs> right you can use the flares on the ripple enemies though when they're kind of cloaked and their little okay. water ripple coming towards you and yeah. it gets i didn't know what that, that was at first when it approached me as yeah. a ripple and i was just staring at it i was like what's this and it, then it just kind of moved around and it didn't really pop out. I, oh. Huh. I, I, wish, I wish I hadn't seen it in that Xbox showcase because I feel like it lessened a little bit. But I mean, it shouldn't be overlooked how cool of an enemy design that is, is to have oh. a mm. weird mirror reflection ripple monster. Sarah, you say nay to the ripple creatures? And I'm not saying nay, I just wouldn't lose myself over the incredible enemy design of putting someone's torso on their lower half. What are you talking? But it, it narratively makes sense because it's like Cauldron Lake. They came from reality. the lake. Oh, okay. Water, Sarah. I thought it's you would understand genius. this. It's yeah. I didn't see, I didn't <laughs> see the genius. Idea. I didn't see the genius there. Yeah. As someone whose shirt I, is drenched, I was hoping you'd understand it better than most. I died and I, <laughs> apparently I, I wasn't entirely submerged enough <laughs> you look like a in the lore does. of the game i do like w when you shoot them and they die and they fall over they're the they're they have the normal bottom half at that point and it's kind of yeah. like a seamless transition which is cool yeah so i have been playing this game on story mode yeah because uh, i didn't like the combat and i find story mode so funny because alan in little alan's world the dark shadows, <laughs> instead of like killing you on sight, they literally just sort of like shoulder check you and then gently lower you to the ground. <laughs> and like over and over and over again, like they'll come up to you and they'll kind of just like shoulder check push you and Alan will just go, eh. And then I'll just kind of fall to the ground and it'll do like zero damage. But wait, if these are so, like, because there's like the, f not friendly shadows, but there's definitely the shadows that are secretly. No, the evil, sh the shadows that will attack you. Okay, so even the ones they, that will they attack you. They just kind of shoulder just... check him and like gently lower him to the ground and he's like, <laughs> And then it's, they kiss him gently on the forehead. And then they kiss him and they pat him on the head and they say, <laughs> better luck next time, buddy. Good luck with chapter seven. Uh, <laughs> Bo has a really... Interesting take. I like this idea. Uh, saying, I found when switching between Alan and Saga, it felt right to give them a different weapon quick slot. 
It made the first few moments after switching intense as I had to remember my setup, but I like that idea because my instinct, of course, is like, it okay, feels... well, shotguns on the left, uh, pistols on the right, but it's like, oh, no, that is kind of cool, like, to jumble it fully so you absorb pistols them as up, different characters. Man. Pistols upwards. Pistol up? Oh, disgusting. Pistol, yeah. I shouldn't pistols even talk left. to a pistol up person. Pistol what? left! Are you out of your mind? Pistol left easily. <laughs> Shotgun on the left, I'll agree with that. Pistol up, <laughs> uh, rifle on the bottom, and bolt on the right. That's just where's your healing? Sense. Like scattered around. <laughs> I care wow. about guns. She's yeah, really well thought Haley, through. Haley's philosophy of the quick stop Haley's Haley. doing a zero dog kill run. Like I, I watched her get like mauled down by like five of the dogs because she refused to kill it. <laughs> Those are they are hard. Those have been most of my deaths. Yeah. yeah. And the fact that they're like spawning again after I ran through that area, like what is, I thought I just would clear them out and they'd be done, but this is just their home turf now, I guess. They don't respect walls or anything either. Like I went in the house and I feel like game law is like, when you're in the building, they de-aggro, but the wolves were like, and like knocked the door down, <laughs> came in and kept They opened the me. door to walk yeah. in. <laughs> Hello. Uh, Cal M., and actually, they're not alone. They say, it's been said a few times that Remedy has learned from the Resident Evil games, but it takes more than save rooms and a similar UI for that to be true. Oh, Cal, you cheeky mf -er. Resident <laughs> Evil knows how to design and pace its combat encounters. It knows exactly how and when to ramp up the action and apply pressure, and when to give the player a breather, something this game seemingly has no clue about. If they put half as much effort into designing fun and interesting combat encounters as they put into mediocre musical segments... I think I'd be enjoying oh, it first. Okay, look, we're all sorry you died. This was real by Whoa. <laughs> I was fine with coming for the combat because I do agree that like combat is the weakest <clears throat> part of this game. Pacing of overall is fine. The boss fights have been miserable, but coming for the musical, it's, that is where I will. You're draw not the making line. any friends. Then. Yeah, that is, sorry, that is sorry, unacceptable. Cal, sorry, buddy. Uh, yeah, it is an interesting idea of like Resident Evil. They've just honed it so well after so many years of making you always feel like, all right, this is the stretch. We're going to push you to your limit uh, and mm -hmm. we'll give you just you what you need. You can tell when they want you to like, but they're trying to waste your bullets basically. Right, right. right. And, and it, this game doesn't have that pinch as obvious. Right. They're pretty generous with ammo though. Like it, it's one of those kind of systems where, oh, you're low on health and you open the next drawer. It's all health items. Like mm -hmm. they know how to balance it. Yeah, I don't think they're trying. Like, I don't think that they want the combat to sort of be the focus of the game, which is fine by me. Yeah. yeah. It, it, is, it is a weird feeling because, like, I have complete faith in the narrative and the world, but it is a feeling of just like, I don't know if I fully trust that I'm in the best hands. But, I mean, for combat encounters, pacing, all this stuff, but it's like best hands is Resident Evil, you know, which is uh, tough to compete with, obviously. Um, on that note, real quick, Haley, before I forget, uh, Hayden Berthelot birth a very lot they say this is probably a little late in the playthrough to share this but it's a cheesy way to play so maybe it's for the best containers don't spawn what's in them until you open them so if a container is close to a save point you can quick save then make trips to the locker to force loot that you want out of them if you don't oh. get something useful <laughs> or you get the hundredth bottle of pills that you don't have storage room just uh storage room for just quick load uh, and then quickly to save and repeat. Mm -hmm. until my you containers go what you want. were empty once I like I had like 30 bullets and my containers were like empty. So I had to go put my bullets in the shoebox so they would give me bullets again. <laughs> Please, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's... uh, it's Just it, story mode things. I definitely... I'm trying to remember if it was even... It must have been a dump on the ground, but at some point in a boss fight, I ran out of... I don't know if it was before a boss fight, but I ran out of pistol ammo. D dump on the ground? What is this, coffee world? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was a little slow on that. No. Jeff, um, why didn't you laugh at that, man? I did. I, just I think you have filtered. Oh, I see. I'm changing <laughs> I the laughed story. through my nose. It was kind of a... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's his gut busting laughter is through the nose. Yeah. I also scream through my nose too. Right, right, right. right. Either, so. <laughs> and he poops and pees through his nose. Yeah. The point is, at some point the game just like gave me like, here's 33 bullets. Here you go, you stupid idiot. And it's just like a weird feeling of like, okay, sure, I'll just take this and get ready for this next fight. Thank you very much for having mercy on my poor It must aim. be hard to balance that where oh, if yeah. the boss fight you need, that's in the way of progressing the story and you show up there with one bullet yes you're, you can't progress the stories it must be hard to figure out where to strategically like shove bullets at you and where to not yeah, yeah. this game does have a lot of that though I, there's a lot of sequences where i'm like wow nothing has happened except for me getting 15 bullet pickups i'm pretty sure something's coming up <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right did you guys well uh, we'll save it for when it Military? comes up no 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 uh, well it, it? in the boss fight with um the brothers in the woods right 
Uh, where there's like the two of them and it's like the glowing red. Yeah, I don't think they were the brothers, but they were okay. cops. No, the, the, oh, the sheriff. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yes, jeez, yes. Mulligan the, and something. <clears throat> yes. Mulligan and Thornton. Yeah, when it's like mm. the glowing red and all that stuff. Um, I died to them a lot. Um, oh, and yeah. then I'm pretty sure what happened is I just killed one of them then and then it just like cut to the cutscene like I beat both of them. I I think it was like did it reload like after you did you kill one and then it reloaded you you I died and then it reloaded you after you'd already killed one of them I don't think so maybe I'm misinterpreting it but that was my read as it was just like an ultimate mercy play after I died so many times like you know what here just we're moving on don't worry about it interesting last episode you said you could shoot people from the light areas all you wanted and the light never went <laughs> no I cut that part out I think you actually the same I, I noticed that got <laughs> cut out and I laughed about it. <laughs> did you really hear wait that got cut <laughs> I I don't like to seem confused or in the deepest of it. So if you're listening to this, this is me <laughs> being well? fully it on top is. of it. Say whatever you want, Leo. You can finally say it. Game on, Jeff them, whatever you want. Let it out of your nose, buddy. This is your chance. <laughs> no, I'm good. Okay, great. Um, let's see. A lot of people wrote in uh, with the idea of combat isn't their cup of tea. Uh, Cozy wrote in saying, I like the story so far, but the game's combat's holding me back. Uh, we Sing worked because it gave us a banger of a track, broke up the visual and tonal mo- monotony of Alan's side, and engage the story and combat at the same time. But for the rest of these chapters, the two are divided. We use the WR slash MP to get to bosses, then shoot them. Then they go down too quickly to be impactful set pieces. This divide is critical to pacing and a trapping of the genre Remedy chose, but Alan's Lamp and WR are opportunities to add environment challenges to combat. But this is obviously easier said than done. WR? Yeah, what's what WR? WR? I don't know what W... WR and MP. Is it WR, MP to get to bosses? Oh, oh, is it writing room Mind Palace? Mind Place. Oh. I think that's oh. what's going on. Yeah. yeah, we all... I forgot we all agreed on Yeah, we cut that yeah, out, Ben. Could you cut us out being confused? Yes, yes. snip, snip, snip. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Villas wrote in talking about how 70% of the, the fights... They feel superfluous. The combat in the game reminds me a lot of when I'm running D&D for my friends. I just put fights in there because I think they're <laughs> necessary. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, t- I totally have been thinking, if I didn't like this combat, this would be too much combat, for sure. Isn't Resident Evil 4 combat kind of like that a lot of times? It's just like plugging the plugus in between the like fun areas. Like You'll just run straight for a while, and they're just like, bah! and you're like, and you just keep going. I think there's something different with Resident Evil 4, though. It just It feels like every enemy you fight is like a little mini pinata like gonna give you some good stuff um Mm, like okay okay, get some pesetas get whatever you need here and i feel like for this it doesn't have that satisfying big loot drop with every enemy you know yeah so it feels i mean i just don't like the flashlight like the running around with the flashlight with the cops and like having to get all the well it's like for me i would be like aiming it and then i wouldn't know when it had like used been used up completely and oh, then yeah. the guy with the rifle had like he absolutely had a no scope on me, so like I'd be running, running. He'd go to aim, and I would try to like go the other way at the last second, and it was just like I couldn't even dodge his bullets. It was just like a continuous that, shot. I don't know. He was that boss fight was a total shit show. I <laughs> I I am mostly enjoying the combat in other places, but that was that was the one boss fight where it's like. I don't even know where I'm getting shot from. Yeah, I've I've also been playing on story mode, uh, Sarah, mm. and like, mm. and that is the one fight where it seemed like they were hitting way harder than any other enemy in the game. Like, I still died a couple times there, and wasn't even clear where I was getting shot from. And it's like, mm-hmm. okay, I just have to like run after you and find where you are and kill you a couple times, and I'm not sure how many times I have to do this. And yeah, it it ultimately just wasn't. Also wasn't very interesting. I don't as a like boss the fight boss either. arenas either. They put a lot of like garbage on the ground, like bushes and rocks that I find that I keep getting stuck on while I'm trying to like strafe or back up or just like run in a direction. Yeah. Um and it yeah, it literally just feels like a shit show of like me running around going like and it's like it doesn't I do not feel like I am strategizing like in any sense it's sort of just like a show from beginning to end i think Mm. in that fight in particular it really felt like that i think there's a reason that you don't often fight people with ranged projectiles in survival horror games you know like i guess what the island in resident evil 4 is kind of an exception i suppose but it's kind of it's tough to have that in the genre you kind of need some people coming towards you with melee instead of i'm gonna sit on a ledge and snipe you it's like it's not really a fun thing to do and also snipers who instantly like warp to different locations. Right, right. Is, yeah. It's just like, where are you at this point, and where am I? 
And what yeah, where am even I? Where even am I? And what am I doing? Yeah. Where am I? Uh, Chris F. Uh, and what, who are these little guys <laughs> on my screen? <laughs> uh, Why are they dancing? Chris F. <laughs> writes in and they say they also, they didn't find the comment to be uh, that satisfying. Uh, so they bumped the game down to easy as well. And while it feels silly, it made the experience much better overall. Um, I expect. I had a tough time with the, I don't want to fully dive into it yet, but the Cynthia Weaver, uh, Cynthia Weaver boss fight. And so that was when I was like, I'm going to bump it down to story mode. And then after that boss fight, I bumped it back up. But I was like, I'm glad I just like had that option for like this little fight. I don't want to really stay up too late tonight beating my head against a wall. So <laughs> let me just tweak it a little bit. Now, I had after... a point in that fight where I couldn't shoot. I had a glitch where my mm -hmm. guns didn't work and I couldn't equip anything. So I just had to walk up to Cynthia and, Merce, and say, take me. <laughs> <laughs> I submit. <laughs> take me. I'm like, Tor. <laughs> It's the fact that like Leo likes the combat is almost like a red flag for me. Yeah. <laughs> because like Leo likes <laughs> like like he, you know, like the games that Leo likes, the combat's usually like you need to be pretty good at all the details, you know, to really get enjoyment out of it. You kind of have to be creative and you kind of have to like see everything as an opportunity to like test your skills. And I just like to be like, blam blam, done, blam, 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 headshots, cool, done. Yeah, more of like I mean, it's not it's not wildly complex combat going into this thing. It's not like some but the way Leo's like Leo and I got game. one bullet and like two people. I just look at it and I go, pain. This is a pain in the ass. This is a pain in the ass. <laughs> I, if I was like, okay, whoops, sorry for what I'm about to say. If I was dying more, I'd probably be a lot <laughs> less. Hollywood. If I was a bad at playing Whoa. video games, Whoa. I could see this not <laughs> <I> being. <laughs> I never would have said a sentence like that if I knew what if I was about to say. I Jesus. was like bad at video games. Is this what it feels like I to like be in the that dark you place? I thought of that oh, sentence sorry. before you said it. You're like, here I go. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, totally, it's like running from the dark presence. on us. Running from the yeah. dark presence and getting killed, it's like immediately like, oh, well, this is a really stupid segment. And they actually designed mm -hmm. it as idiots. They decided to be idiots for designing this. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most places I died too. Is running. From yeah. I died there too. I would just run it's into it. Crash Bandicoot ass gameplay. It's so weird. I agree. So Perfect accurate. gameplay. That said, I did love. There's that little moment, and I think it's when you're in the police station later. And it's also the dark presence coming at you. But it's just like a little moment of before there's like waves of enemies coming down the stairs. Do you remember this? Well, there's just a moment before that where it's just like a dark presence wave. Just like, boosh, just like comes through and things are like moving on the walls as it comes through before all the enemies come down. So that dark presence, when it's coming around at you, delightful. And not when you're whoa, 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 running through a hotel trying to <laughs> yeah. figure out which way to turn and yada, yada, yada. Yeah, where am I supposed to go? Present. And the other little Leo thing about the combat for sure is the Here upgrades being having like a couple little weird specific upgrades that I get to go. Yeah, that you know that. that you can combine in a very yeah. specific way to like. And I feel like I'm combat. the only person who ever did it, even though everybody does it. Yeah, there's yeah. only three per <laughs> thing. It's not that much, yeah, that's right? <laughs> but there are three Leo things. Uh, that's Sam, the type of trick that needs to be played on my brain. Yes. <laughs> uh, Sam writes in. They say I'm conflicted on the encounter design within the open areas and saga section. It seems here the enemy encounters and spawns are mostly randomized. Oftentimes I'll be heading in a direction of the woods to grab a collectible and I encounter a group of enemies and then die because I'm clumsy. After reloading and walking back, I often find those same enemies and encounters are nowhere to be found. I understand this allows exploring to be unpredictable, but this either meant I couldn't get revenge or that encountering a lot of enemies by chance was just a waste of resources. That's interesting. The idea of like, am I just wasting my shots here? That is a I, tough struggle. I, I have felt that sometimes too. Um, just a sting of like, well, this place is out of the way, but I, I want to go explore to see what's over there. And then it's like, it turns out to not really be anything. And I used a bunch of ammo just to like clear out the enemies that were there. And it, it just feels like a waste. And that, that doesn't feel great. Yeah. And maybe there's something about Resident Evil, like Resident Evil 2 in particular with the remake, you know, of like, it's all such clean segmented things. Like, is it worth it to go down this hallway? Okay. Yes. Whereas when it's a little more of an open area, it's like, ambiguous about okay what is worth clearing out what is worth pushing through and exploring you know it's not so much well i've done one two and three and now do number four you know and i killed a guy three hours ago and i need to go through this hallway again and maybe he'll come back to life maybe he won't but his body's still there that right game was really good <laughs> it was really good yeah uh it was the best game of that year it's true that's what minmax said uh mogs wrote in they said uh do you remember when minmax said that jeff I do. Okay. Did you hear them? <laughs> Did you hear the people cry? <laughs> uh, Mogs wrote and they said, the game goes through long stretches without combat and often when it occurs, it is brief. Is this a survival horror or is it primarily a story game 
a story-based game with aspects of survival horror gameplay. I think it's a game that's good and they kind of don't care about genre too much, honestly. Well, <laughs> you know what I, I mean in a weird I, way? I'm trying to I know things Alan have to Wake have genre. Too. <laughs> I know we live in the real world where things have a genre. We have to slot it, but like... I don't know. I think they just are dabbling in horror. Does that make it a horror game? Well, yes. I mean, you talk about slotting. <laughs> you know it, what I mean, though? Yeah, I hear you. But they're the ones who quick slotted it themselves. Like with the announcement of this game, that was like one of the first PR messaging points yeah. is this is survival horror. Remedy's doing full survival horror my for comment. the first time. <laughs> it was dumb. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We'll edit it out. Don't worry. Thank uh, you. Let's see. Uh, Adam Marin writes in and says, I'm enjoying the gameplay, but seeing as how the worlds of uh, Remedy are now in full collision, it kind of feels like a missed opportunity not to have any powers av available in combat. Might make this a very different kind of game, but it's fun to imagine Saga using telekinesis or some sort of thematically appropriate Deus Ex Machina ability to knock a dead tree around or throw him into a Taken or something, or suddenly you can make a Taken be struck by lightning. Yeah, I think we've kind of just been spoiled by control. I definitely have that feeling, I, though, sometimes when I see, like, an object fall, it's like, God, I wish I could just pick that up and chuck it at somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sarah, I used to work at Game Informer, and I went on this uh, cover <laughs> trip for one of our magazine covers. You don't say that. Sounds really familiar, actually. Oh, okay. Good, good. I, we went to Remedy for Control, and we asked them, is this a survival horror game? And I was surprised how immediately they were like, no. You feel empowered in this game. That's not something in survival horror. You're empowered to do crazy stuff and kill everybody. And I wonder if that's still their their philosophy on it is like because it's survival horror, you can't feel too empowered, which is a tough line to ride if you want to make your game uh, fun also. Right. Unless it's a musical sequence and you have a flare gun in that case, we're just going <laughs> to let you go nuts for empowerment. We yeah, haven't even like dug is. into the musical, like the musical. Oh, yeah. Look, there's yet. oh, look, we're dancing around it. Why? Bah. We're quite literally dancing around the best part of this game. Why we're at the would beginning we of, like coffee world still? Yeah. Why would we yeah. talk about that when we could talk about Instagram expert finishing off the last combat thing saying, do you all think the very small shaky hands while aiming is a visual bug or is it intended as an animation to show the scaredness of the characters? They're shaky I hands. I, I guess I didn't is. notice that either, so maybe it's a bug no, for you. Maybe it's you, actually, though, who wrote it in. <laughs> <laughs> there were a your red thumbstick like that. There were a lot of typos in the message, too. They were clearly <laughs> terrified of a jump screen <laughs> appearing on their Patreon window. Um, let's see. Oh, a uh, Davin M. Back to Coffee World. They say, anyone else, anyone else get some fun bugs in Coffee World? I was exploring a small section of Coffee World and was surprised by how dilapidated it was. The Ferris wheel didn't seem to have any carriages on it, with one of them blocking the path to the rest of the park. Haley it, had it, that one. It was really funny. Yeah. It wasn't uh -huh. until I read the note for the cache in the area that I realized they were supposed to still be attached to it, apparently. You had See, the same Haley one? didn't realize that. I was watching her stream and she rolled up to the Ferris wheel and all of the cups had just fallen onto the ground to the point where they were like blocking her route to other parts of Coffee World. And then she got the... <laughs> and all of us in the Twitch chat were like, um, like this is not, and then Haley found the note, and immediately she didn't. She was just so gung ho about finding these cups, like she was going to wade through every single cup that had crashed to the ground until she found all the ones with stripes on them. <laughs> and everyone was like, "It's a bug!" Like screaming at me from the gum. I was wow. like, "What?" <laughs> yeah, I I had that with the espresso world or whatever it was, where mm. you it it almost completely blocked my game because you you had to. You had to like start it, you know, you, you have to start it mm -hmm. and get it and get like the little in my game. It was just levers and the levers were going up and down because none of the cars were attached to them. <laughs> um, and, and so I was like, this is weird. But I, I did get the one to get up so I could crawl down in there. But then it was blocking the tunnel like one of them because one of them was halfway warped through the deck and it was blocking the tunnel that I was supposed to go through. And I was like, what the hell is and it took me way too long before I looked it up and then some people were like, yeah, I'm stuck here and I've tried reloading and it, and I just can't get past it. Um, but, but someone else had, had mentioned like, you have to, you have to like save once that, once you do that and then start the mach machine and then reload after that or whatever. And I like followed yeah. their steps and it actually fixed it. But otherwise it's like progress blocking bug because the things can somehow become detached and like, then I wish I could half see the world. It's like such a the weird... collisions explode and it just go poof. like the fact yeah. that you know that that happened because when Haley loaded back in, yeah. her little coffee cups, cups were like, like swinging madly, and I was just oh like, my fall, God. Off, fall off, fall <laughs> off. 
That's sweet. Uh, Tim writes in, says, there's a decent amount of dark humor in the game. Early in a coffee world, there's a sign with moose facts. We learn that Mocha the moose is six years old and will live to be 25. He's also the only moose addicted to coffee. Inside the gift shop, there's a note saying that Mocha died of a heart attack and did not have a tolerance for stimulants. Now they need to rush to find a new Mocha. R.I.P. Mocha. Yeah. There's a, somewhere earlier on, too, it's like there's a note, a review, or something of someone be like, and the moose died. It's like, I kind of set it up for like, okay, this is going to be a weird twisted take, but good it's fun like a stuff. a news report on it, like a little news clipping. Right, <laughs> right, right. Uh, let's see. Uh, ooh, so many places we can go. Oh, this is... It, they had like signs all around Coffee World that just said like F U N fun fun fun, um, and I noticed like the F and the U were like the red and the yellow that was very E three. Like every time I saw that fun sign, I, it felt like an E three sign going around there. But maybe just if you have a red and yellow big letters, Remedy, uh, you've done it again. Brilliant, you've done Dude, it again. No one back. does so it maybe, yeah, like they them. Brought back E three. <laughs> I had a meta moment where you. When you're going around, um, there's the coffee giant coffee pot that starts laughing at you. Yeah. Uh, when you go past it, and it's it scared me so bad that I yelled Jesus, and then Saga immediately yelled Jesus yes. as well. And yes. I, and I, I just melded with her and became one. Yeah, that whole coffee pot and this entire quest of like, okay, you got to piece together that murder scene on the float is one of those situations where I was definitely ahead of the case board in kind of a frustrating way oh. of like, okay, we need the yeah. laughing thing. Like, all right, I remember the coffee pot laughing. Let me go grab it. And I go there, stand behind it. Like, I'm looking at the cassette. Why can't I grab this? I like, did the okay. exact same thing. Did you? It was That's so unsatisfying and it made me really angry. It's yeah. like, why do I have to wait for Saga to figure it out? I did it. I understand. Like, just let me grab a cassette. I know I can. It's an inch away. That, right. that was That's my biggest gripe with the game, I think, is just yeah. don't stop the progression because saga hasn't looked at a picture of the cassette on a cork board for and, sure and do, that, do you still like the mind palace do you still like the mind place i do i'm using oh. it less often and i do like that if you forget about it for a while and come back you automatically fill in all the oh, things it's so satisfying just dig, dig, dig. it's like watching mm -hmm. a like you know when you're bringing a pokemon that's not been in your team for a while and just watching like the levels go up once they're <gasps> in one fight totally. like it's just so satisfying yeah. to have a rapid fire yeah but i definitely yeah. see the flaws now more for sure yeah, that uh, when we talked about the game on the on the episode of of the Midmax show, Kyle was Kyle was complaining about a, a specific pet peeve that I also have in games where it's um, you they like give you an objective and you get right to that objective and then they're like, oh no, actually, in order to open this, you have to do like four more things, and it's just a it's a weird way of designing detours into a, a level design as opposed to just like. If you just if you just started from the from the beginning of like you have to go to these three places and then you'll go to this other place it it wouldn't it wouldn't like be as frustrating and when I was playing through this section I was like oh this is the section that Kyle is talking about specifically <laughs> except yeah. then it happened like three more times where it's like wow this is a big detour that you're that you're putting me on again um, and it it. it the those were those were some of the dips in this section of of like me getting getting more frustrated with it. Yeah, uh, Trent T. Uh, by the way, also it's frustrating to have like those notes that just say like for later. You know, it's like kind of yeah. What, I guess okay. How does she know and, that? And they, they yeah. put the dot. They put like the this is a new thing dot on it every time you go back into it, mm. and then it and then also in your little filing cabinet it's like oh this has a new thing oh but they're still for later it's the same two things that you've had the entire time yeah uh i i, I don't mind it i think it is still worthwhile to have in there something unique and it does it does help me a lot for just kind of like keeping track of the story uh, it kind of locks it in a, in a unique way me yeah. too there's times it's stupid and there's times it's really really helpful and i love being able to hover over the picture and get the extra flavor text even of mm -hmm. like the questions you should be asking about this yeah and the profiling I still like, and I like more now that we know too officially that it is like she finally put it together that, oh, this isn't just me being smart. <laughs> right, right. You're right. really good at your job, but actually you have magical powers. <laughs> oh, it turns out I'm just a Norse god. Okay, fine, I guess. Um, so there's that whole um, workshop, uh, the Kava. Uh, 
Kalevala Knights Workshop um, where you see more stuff about the cults, kind of the, the cult HQ. There's all of the paperwork um, from the Federal Bureau of Control going through, uh, working through the cult, all that stuff. So the cult got their logo from the control logo, which is the weird thing, like from the FPC logo. They kind of like remixed it into their logo. I like how they're dumb. Like, that's fun. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, I, it's like we talked about last time. I'm very satisfied that it definitely is going that angle. And, like, control hates on them, and they're like, oh, don't worry about it. This will be an easy one. And they, like, get those files. They're like, what the heck? They don't even think we're that scary. And they're, like, pissed about it. Yeah. <laughs> we're, they're we're like, they say we're disorganized. We're not disorganized. And then, like, you find all the emails about, like, trying to schedule the sauna. And then, like, like please stop, like... What were they complaining about? Like, there was some, like, minor thing that, like, call members were doing that they were like, please stop doing this. Like, oh, yeah, they were, like, upset that they lost Nightingale. They were like, please make sure, like, that you check the woods and make sure, like, no one's wandering around the woods when you perform a ritual sacrifice. Like, that to me was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I like that workshop. Like, it, it's funny, again, just, like, what can be scary. But there's a little moment, like, coming out of a safe room in that little workshop area where there was just, like, a metallic ping sound like somebody like dropped a metal cup on the ground or something and it's like that's all it takes sometimes it's just like one weird note that will really freak me out in this environment uh trent t wrote in uh saying i really love the manuscript page you get in the basement of the calavella knight's workshop that describes the mini boss encounter waiting for saga upstairs it really escalated the tension and made me a little bit scared to climb the ladder and face him i was expecting a big hulking monster the way alan was describing it so i was a little disappointed when it was just a bigger guy with a big hammer but still <laughs> that's cool that's, that's as big as guys get yeah come on what do you want uh i will say at this point when you find out that like Ilmo and Yako are in the club. Yes. And the cult. I was like, the if club. Ilmo and Yako are in the cult, I'm in the cult. Like, <laughs> like literally, I was like, if Ilmo and Yako are rocking with the cult of the tree, I'm rocking with the cult of the tree. I was like, there's no way it's bad. You don't understand, Saga. You don't get it. He's a monster. It's a it's amazing how that turn has not made me like them any less. And and it's I've also been amazed how profiling them, like these two goofball characters you're watching these parody commercials of profiling them and having them say these cryptic quotes seriously i was like this still works <laughs> i'm really surprised how compelling i find them in creepy modes <laughs> uh poor and curly writes in and says shout out to peter franzen as the brothers i've only ever seen him in the history channel vikings show and he's appropriately hammy in both He's as hammy in that Vikings show. Maybe I need to watch this Vikings show. I'll have show. to watch it. All right. Well, there we go. Uh, Craig Belmont writes in, says, as a horror fan, I typically hate jump scares. They feel cheap and as an easy way to scare your audience. Uh, I cannot help but love them here and live in the stressful situation they force me in. They throw a couple jump scares at you back to back and hold them back as a pseudo fear that looks over the player throughout the rest of the section and it makes me so tense and paranoid. The specific example I think to is the well boss fight loop section with the two cops from Bright Falls. Yeah, so when you go back to the well, I had that experience as well. They put like a as well. They put a jump scare at that moment after you've already like encountered the well, but when you go back to it, then it'll give you the jump scare with it. And that one definitely right. me too. And and I I did really like that um just the design of coffee world like that the well in general you i think you get the backstory like very early on about what's going on with that and it's definitely yeah. the creepiest thing in that area and then it's like centrally located where like every time i was going down a path it's like oh my god it's that freaking well again and something right next to something coffee is world. going to jump out at some point and it's like i don't even want to look at it i'm like <laughs> turning the camera as i'm running past it and then yeah they they like they they timed that out in the cruelest way possible, um, and they got me on that one too. That that was one of the only jump scares that it's that I was kind of okay with, um, just because <laughs> I, I had been waiting for it for so long. Uh, and they they get you on the way back. Yeah, Did I was trying to jump that, into that, the well the whole time. I was like, the minute they were like, "This is the murder well," I was like, "Get me in there." I know I'm going to have to go down there eventually. Yeah. Let's just get this over with. Rip the bandaid off. Sounds important. Did you notice that the names of the brothers who used to commit the murders in the well are like almost identical to Yako and Ilmo's names, like kind of hinting that they're reincarnated versions or oh. descendants or something? Oh, I like that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Jared Pierce right in, writes in and says, a lot has been said about how good the environment details are in this game. Uh, but for me, the most affecting location so far has been Saga's trailer. 
Beer bottles left everywhere, general mess, and a picture of Logan left on the bed. Saga getting a glimpse of how badly her life would fall apart if she lost her child was brutal and made the whole sequence of trying to call her family and getting no answer super effective for me. Uh, yeah. yeah, but we just found out we were related to Tor and Odin. Yeah, so that's kind of more exciting. The coolest guys ever. <laughs> if I also walked into them superpower. and they were like, I'm your grandpa and your grunkle, I'd be like, okay, yes. I love this. <laughs> I haven't even seen Logan. I don't care about her. She's not a god. <laughs> They're also I just really hear her occasionally. Her. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're nice to her. They're like good grandpa and grunkles. Like they're not just. Like, and they what give her like actual advice, and she's like, "You guys are just cr some crazy schmucks." And they're literally like, "Listen, don't pay attention to the story." And she's yeah. like, "You crazy old men." And I'm like, "No, Saga, are you listening? Like they're giving you real advice." I do. Yeah, I so like that listen. one moment with Tor when Tor is like, "Logan's alive," and like she kind of has like a breath of like she's like thank you for saying that i really needed to hear that and that was like a really nice moment i almost took a beat and i was like oh she needed that she is having a tough time like someone's validating her feelings for once instead of rose gaslighting her no one's in the pond what are you talking about like that was <laughs> that, that would get insanely frustrating and it would make you feel crazy yeah I, I think it's just a cool structure for a game in a thousand different ways but one of them is just like an idea of like especially with the Federal Bureau of Control, right? The FBC being this larger force that's dealing with a lot of these anomalies around the world, but then the struggle of Alan Wake is resuming in on one AWE and just what a nightmare it is to live through that experience. And then I like to flip on it a little bit from that discussion of like having Torn Odin be like, look, there's the whole story here, but you're above it. Like, don't be part of the story, make the story. And so it's such a cool idea of like, you're, you're sinking in this world, but then you get kind of, a, a narrative cheat code of just some people being like, you're above this stuff, don't worry about it. It's like, oh, okay. It's it's a cool feeling. It's true. It like completely changes the the vibe of Saga now approaching the problem. Before right. she was like, what's happening? And as soon as one other person outside of her psyche is like, no, you're you're fine. She's like, cool. And it just moves forward from there. Yeah. It was a good pace change. Uh, Jeff, I'm, uh, somebody on... Twitch, they say, Jeff is so cute, I want to pinch his cheeks. Do you want me to ban that person, or how are you feeling about it? I saw that. Hey, <laughs> they're right here. The up, up <laughs> so there did pinch you get there to you pinch them? Nice. Come on, man. For they free? asked for it. Oh. Yep. Um... Patreon.com slash Max with two ends. Unlock the podcast version and you won't have to look at Jeffem's cheeks anymore. That's right. Get it on the go. Get Jeffem's cheeks on the go. Um, let's see. Uh, Ampex writes in and says, In Logan's room... In the Anderson trailer, there are pictures taped to the wall that she has drawn. There's one of Tor and Odin, and another one of her and David playing the boss battle against the the former in control. Which is the name of the boss fight. She even drew the control health bar in the bottom left corner. Oh, Both what? of them are holding controllers in the picture, though. And since control is a single-player game, David obviously did the classic move of handing Logan an unplugged controller so that she thought they were playing control together. Oh, there's so many layers to that. <laughs> That's so nice. <laughs> That's perfect. Uh, Green that or Alan Wake wrote it to be co-op in that world. <laughs> the way it should oh, be. Girl. Yeah. Co-op control? Hell yeah. Um, did you have an impact uh, personally with that news, Haley? Did you see that Remedy is kind of rebooting their, their co-op multiplayer thing? Did you no. see this? what's that? So they're working with uh, Tencent on a free-to-play co-op multiplayer thing. Um and then they announced recently, like, you know what? We're kind of going back to the drawing board and we're not going to make it free to play anymore. Um, and we're going to give it more of that remedy DNA type of thing, which is interesting to see. I wonder if, like, the success of Alan Wake's reception kind of made them think, like, are, have we raised our own standards We've now? We've earned this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we need money now. <laughs> give us money, please. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Green Mountain State writes in and says, I really like the scene in Logan's room of Saga's trailer. In this moment, Saga is hit with how real the situation is getting and can't shrug off people mentioning Logan's death. The music picks up, her urgency picks, in, picks up, uh, and I sprinted out of that trailer with it. It felt like a big turning point to, to me. Yeah, that's definitely her her big turning point. And every time then she sees Alan, it's always like, why, why did you write my daughter into this? What is wrong with you? Sweet which, Jesus. Which then when you see it from his perspective and he doesn't even hear that part, you're right. uh, the whole time I'm waiting for like, What's he, how's he going to feel about the daughter thing, but it doesn't even come through? That's, like, heartbreaking. Yeah, that part is cut out a little bit. And then it's weird thinking that, like, yeah, he's 
only writing Saga into the story because he encountered her from those weird mergings, which is a, a fun, but fun loop But it's here. Scratch writing the story, right? And he's right. editing it now. So right. Scratch would have been the one using Saga to get to Alan. And now Alan's editing it to try to make it so Scratch doesn't just destroy her and her family, I guess. Scratch is writing it, but I swear Alan says, like, who's that Saga Anderson? I should put her in. Yeah, this. he does at some point. But maybe that's before he realized that Scratch was writing it or maybe that's that? she's there as a counter to to what scratch is doing he wanted a stronger female protagonist okay get woke go broke over that before Man, alan woke. Scratch. <laughs> <laughs> if i just search twitter for the phrase alan woke how many tweets are going out oh, there every man. day so many i don't want to play a song like alan gets the easy parts of the story like sure like running around a hotel could be a lot of work but he gets a lot of cutscenes. And I noticed when I play Saga, you don't get as many cutscenes because she has no like actor cutscenes. Hmm. So Alan's like yeah, usually yeah. my like more relaxing, like I'm here to watch my little movie, like run around my hotel. But Saga is like, <laughs> you gotta put in work. Like, you're putting in work. Like, you're turning lights on. This is a game. You're like, you've got stuff to do. <laughs> it's true. Uh let's see. So then uh Saga return for no chance. This is kind of the funky one. Um, where you see the cult like swarming in on the lodge, which is a cool invasive feeling. You're like, oh, that's my that's my safe spot. They can't just walk in there. And then it jump cuts to Alan lying in the blood. Uh, like he argues, I guess, first with Alex Casey about like, we're not your playground. And they argue about the rules of the world and how you can make stuff happen. Um, but then you're playing as Alan Wake in Saga's chapter for this little bit. And he picks up the gun and the flashlight and he's like, eh, nostalgic. Um, and you're hearing Alex Casey screaming off of the distance and everything, right? Yeah, that's that you mentioned. Yeah. Is he Alan there? They would, would they let us play as scratch or does that like break some kind of rule? See, like, I, you know, it's, I hmm. think, I think you, again, I am not the expert in this, but I do think it's, you are Alan and then Scratch inhabits him. Because there's a moment, too, where in this section, Alan's like, Scratch is close now. Scratch is here now. He's so close um, as you're running around as him. So that because people had yeah. said and theorized in the last section that that was Scratch coming out of the lake. And so but then when this happened and he's like, Scratch is so close now, I was like, OK, well, then I guess that subverts that. And this isn't Scratch. But it's, Saga says clear as day after the boss fight, after he turns into Scratch more clearly outside the the sheriff's office or whatever she says wow he was scratch the whole time he I played thought a, alan yeah. told her that scratch was out like he was telling her i thought saga got the message that that wasn't really alan but it was like scratch and then she was just apparently they got lost in translation well he said like he's yeah. like he says like i'm still trapped and that's like the confusing thing yeah. she's like what do you mean you're still trapped said, like scratch is out i'm right. still trapped Okay. But, I'm, but I'm also, you know, b before this conversation, I took that as gospel of like, oh, OK, I see what happened. Yeah, it was scratched the whole time. But, you know, now I'm thinking like, yeah, Saga might not know exactly what's going on. We can't really trust yeah. her interpretation of things. Yeah, that's true. If uh, it is you playing scratch there, I kind of don't like that because it kind of feels like it breaks a rule to me and, and is unfair, like narratively speaking, because like people are pointing out in the, in the comment in the chat, like night you play as Nightingale. But Nightingale doesn't know what's going on. Scratch does. So it's kind of like if you're going to play as a character who knows what's going on, you are that character. It feels like cheating to then be like, oh, I'm Alan, I think. Because like there's a rule in mystery detective fiction that the the narrator can never not be the murderer. And you just don't tell the reader that the whole time <laughs> because that's the thing in the world there's like a famous book i wish i could remember the name but i read it for a class the bible and it's considered the worst mystery book of all time because the the narrator is the killer and we just mm -hmm. don't he just doesn't tell us that in his brain until the end surprise and, he's like, and i did it and it wasn't because <laughs> memory so loss or anything he was just like by the way it was me the end and you're like what the heck i was just you for 250 pages like how <laughs> you forgot to think that for two seconds like it's like the worst way to to put yeah. someone into a story. So I feel heavy rain. Scratch. Yeah. But is Scratch then tricking us? Like, I don't, maybe that's I what think, they're going for. I think maybe they, if it is, you are Scratch, but Scratch himself is a scatterbrain and doesn't realize it. Like, is that a way to kind of cushion it? Maybe like he doesn't, he isn't aware that he is Scratch for those sections. 
I think he either is aware and he's tricking us too, which I could like maybe forgive, but then he has to be aware of the fourth wall where he's in a video game and then like his motives don't make sense anyways. (laughs) Why would he want to destroy the world of the video game he's in? He probably would want to kill me instead. Well, that's just the start. Yeah, I mean, video (laughs) games. There's so much about like evil art being genuinely evil in this, you know? Well, also, there's there's an evil force that can insidiously be in this evil work. <laughs> I, I like that Sarah's already doing her quiet smiling while, while everyone else is talking <laughs> it's about It's all this falling second. apart. But is there, like, there, there are parts that where Alan Wake slash Scratch's behavior would just make no sense whatsoever. But that said, are these instances where Alan Wake is still in the dark place and writing what Scratch is doing and then therefore and influencing, oh, influencing yeah. what he's Ooh. doing? able to stop him a bit because he's editing this like scratch wants to just walk in and shoot Alex Casey in the head, but he's editing it. Maybe that would make way more sense to me. And that I would forgive that. <laughs> oh, okay. But I don't know. Uh, it, it, the whole thing s- still feels a little, a little off to me and you know how, like we're bending backwards to, to come up with a, an answer that might've just been a little bit of clumsy well or maybe we'll see in the final third and it'll lock into place a little bit better maybe maybe Maybe. it will all be as genius as that layer of dust on the vcr maybe maybe that explains (laughs) i still haven't seen a layer of dust like i've been like kind of looking open your eyes sarah you haven't really been looking for it clearly quit squinting um, let's see. Uh, Sean Mills writes in and says, I was really taken by surprise that the game switches you over to Alan during one of Saga's sections. While I thought the atmosphere was still tense, I didn't really understand what was happening. There's blood everywhere, but no bodies. Did Casey run away and leave you alone? Or was he being kidnapped and was trying to fight his way back to you? Was the cult trying to kill you and then left you alone? Or were you trying to do something else? These are the questions we're trying to figure out, Sean. We're with you. Weren't there bodies? I, I, saw some, I saw bodies. I saw, saw bodies. bodies. I thought there were cult bodies. Okay. Yeah, there was one of them shoved through a window, and I was like, whoa. Window death. Defenestration. Hey, whoa, what the heck? Um, Amos Dragon writes, Jeff, how old were you when you learned about the word defenestration? Today, years old. That's right. Amos Dragon writes, and they say, it was very strange for me <laughs> as I went from initiation four directly to return four. Tone clashing aside, it was strange to go from playing Alan Wake to playing Alan Wake. I was not expecting that switch. It also highlighted the wild variation in chapter length. We Sing and No Chance were like 20 minutes and 5 minutes respectively. It made me wonder what made them separate some of those sequences in such short chapters. Not that it's a big deal. I got to hear more end of chapter songs faster than I expected, so it's all good for me. Yeah, I like it. It's always a fun thing. It's like, oh, this is one of those quick little chapters. Yeah. Yeah, and and this... And Alan's final chapter in this section being the same as the final chapter in the last one, kind of, of going back to your house and it being this short little thing. That gave me confidence yeah. of like, oh, I can just keep playing for 50 more minutes and then I'm done instead of having to like pick it up again later. Yeah. Uh, also in Saga Return 4, no chance. This is when the FPC fully comes in and we meet Agent Kieran and they're they're taking over the entire investigation here. And I really love that they did the like, this is our jurisdiction now thing. Yeah, I was yeah. hoping because I always wondered how does the FBC and FBI interact? Like, how come the FBI doesn't talk about the FBC? They seem to be aware <laughs> that it exists, but do they know what they do? Because the whole point of the FBC is to like cover stuff up and then sort of gaslight everyone into not thinking anything just happened. That's like their whole job. But then the FBI knows about them. Do they are they privy to that? I wonder how the governmental structuring of knowledge works in this world. It's weird. I see FBC as like above governments in a lot of ways. I don't think the president yeah. is hip to what's happening at the FBC, you know? Yeah. He's like blissfully unaware. He just says, go do what you need to do. And I'm not going to look. But it was interesting with the FBC agent bleeding on the floor, explaining stuff to you going like, well, doesn't matter now. May as well tell you everything, you know, like for, for, for whatever good it'll do. And it's interesting to see that kind of humanity from the FBC, which I don't know if I saw that much in control, maybe a little in the documents, but it is a little like, yeah, these are humans still and they are still doing their best and afraid to die. (laughs) Yeah. I also really liked in this scene how there was like, I could kind of tell that a woman probably wrote that scene because there was this really interesting underlying like respect of each other, even though they're pissed, like they're both very high up in their field and they're both women working and they're clearly solo and like have a lot of responsibility, but they also are like, you're stepping on my toes, frig off, but they still are like cordial because it's like, oh, I respect you. You probably worked hard to get here too. Like there's like that underlying little 
little feel. And I was like, that feels good. I like they're talking <laughs> on the radio and she's like, yeah, I hear you. Like she, she could just be like, screw off and like turn it off. She's like, yep, I'm here. And like they respect each other. I thought yeah. that was cool. And then it makes kind of, you know, when Kieran gets shot in the police station later on, like it, it helps that bond again of like, okay, we're, yeah. we're working together here, you know? Yeah. Um, she was really getting around that police station, though. I feel like you ran away and then came back, and it's like, oh, she hauled her ass to the other side and put herself up on this chair, even though, like, if I was shot in the leg or attacked in the leg, I was bleeding profusely, I wouldn't yeah. move a She also inch. found something to stop the bleeding. Like, she's competent. Like, she's she went and it. got a bandage and, like, t- like tightened it so that it, she wouldn't bleed out. She doesn't, she doesn't need anybody, but she, like, needs a little help right now, which is interesting. And privacy to change yeah. positions. No. You <laughs> yes. can't be looking. Yeah, of course. They don't want to animate that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like Ati, you know, it's a similar situation. Uh, mm-hmm. Then we get to old gods. Like, I was I was so excited for this chapter. Like that, that tease of we're going to spend some more time with Tor and Odin. It's definitely in this chunk. Yeah, I think the most compelling stuff for me. Um, just like I like Norse mythology. It's like it's so that idea of centering an entire thing around this Valhalla old folks home. I'm in heaven. Uh, Mr. Buttons writes in over on Patreon, says the old gods has been my favorite chapter as saga so far. It's a perfect example of creating open spaces in an overall linear experience. Walking out of the woods to see the giant Valhalla nursing home and the attached wellness center is stunning. And the attention to detail in both buildings is fantastic. From scratches on the floor, what? To some serious water damage that needs to be addressed, the nursing home feels like it's been there for years. Outside of maybe the Hitman trilogy, I think Remedy is unmatched when it comes to making environments that feel real and truly have a sense of place in the world they've created. I, I agree with that building. and only that. Because it's convert, <laughs> it's a converted building. Like it used to be a house and now it's an old folks home. So like the rooms are kind of clunky. Like there's a workout space on the main floor that clearly was a dining room. Right. And that's just where they have to put the workout room. But like that's the reality of a space that gets converted. Like Barry and found this room like didn't have windows. I think like Mandy yeah. May's room didn't have a single window in it, <laughs> which I still think is like incredibly illegal and like suspicious. And- the winding staircase is not good for wheelchair like access. So they have this like right. really inconvenient wheelchair ramp mm-hmm. going all the way up. That was probably like the worst thing to install when it, they could have just had nice ramps, but that's the building they got. So they just had to work with it. I think that's really smart. And they took time to like think, all right, let's just make a building and then turn it into an old folks home, not like make an old folks home building. Mm-hmm. I think that's cool. Yeah. And yeah. just saturate the lighting is going to be so yellow and oppressive and just like the small details of, like when you're by a window hearing like a fly struggling to get out the window it's like oh god there's just so many oh, little touches sarah did you hear the fly the fly sarah the fly i sarah. didn't hear the fly didn't, struggle didn't are you sure like your either. headphones were like connected and it wasn't just like a <clears throat> i think it was there a fly out? in your headphone it, there's a fly are you in sure my headphones. Your headphones like are you sure it wasn't an audio bug i thought that, that remedy put the fly in my headphones though because no one doesn't mm. like them I'm gonna yeah, need I thought it was so interesting. There were no textures in this whole chapter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Matt, I, I did. I did like um, one of those little, uh, you know, deepest dive uh, details. I like when you get up to the yeah. old folks' home and you ring the doorbell, yes. and that's when they pop up the title. That was, yep. That was yeah. Brilliant. Yep. Matt R is right there with you. Right. about that. That is such a good detail. That yeah. That's just a moment where I out loud will say like, oh, yes. Yes, good job. You did it. That is something I love about this game is who doesn't love a late title card and they get to do it 18 times in this <laughs> uh-huh. game. <laughs> it's every time. Uh, Barry W. writes and says, did you notice the anime style fanfic drawings that Rose has proudly hung in the front room of the nursing home? They include Alan longing internally as well as naughty Alan. I love that they kept that they kept Rose obsessive, just like the first game. She seems like a good fit to watch all the old kooks and bright falls. I like. I love finding her fan fiction in yeah. the woods yeah. in the in the thing. Like her fan fiction, honestly, is like better written than most of Alan's writing. <laughs> um, like I would absolutely, I would absolutely read like a full on Alan Wake, like from Rose's perspective, fanfic. Absolutely. Oh. But remember at the end of the at the end of the very sorry we're skipping ahead but like at the end of Saga's thing where they're in the police station they're like we need a piece of art to use the clicker we need a piece of art as like I don't know some kind of gateway I was like please be Rose's fan fiction please be Rose's fan fiction please (laughs) I like that uh, in her little shrine you know she's got like the flashlight there and all that stuff but I like in that shrine too that her articles were kind of like shedding light on Alan in a new way of there's all those articles about like what a 
bad boy, man about town, how he likes to drink in New York. He's kind of a, a little naughty boy. He's, like, oh, I never he's really a writer, just... but he's a cool writer. Right. Not, writing isn't for losers spot. anymore. They're for cool people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Shoji Koto writes in and says, seeing Rose's evolution into her super fandom and how it escalates from the first game to this one is fascinating. Previously, she could barely function due to gushing so much about being uh, starstruck. Now she's leaving fanfic drops in creepy forests while nonchalantly killing Taken and recounting the methods for doing so to Saga as if she's a pro and joking about how it was so hard to find the bodies afterwards with a slightly giddy demeanor, all because Alan supposedly told her to do it. It was all hilarious to me. And Spencer S. says, Rose was a, was a highlight for me, for sure. Learning that she had been receiving Alan's messages, killing Taken, hiding the lunchboxes, and waiting to help Saga recontextualizes all of her wide-eyed fangirling in a cool way, makes her more interesting, less of a comic relief character, while still maintaining her goofy obsession with Alan. She has some great dialogue in this chapter that makes it clear how exciting she seems to think it is to be manipulated by Alan Wake. <laughs> Yeah, I do I love that. I think they're the, repeating the like love triangle thing that Tom Hussein, Barbara, and Cynthia had, which I think is cool because it's just now Alan, Allison, and Rose. And that has me thinking like the loop thing. Like, does this just, does the exact same thing keep happening over and over? Because in Alan Wake 1, Cynthia, who's like the scary, she was actually a very nice character in Alan Wake 1. Like, she was eccentric, but she helped you, sure. which is kind of weird that she's like, just inner nighty killing you now. <laughs> it kind of feels <laughs> odd. But uh, like she was in love with Thomas Zane and like was obsessed with them and wanted to be with him and did all she could to help him. And she's the one who kept the clicker for Alan because Thomas Zane told her to. And that's kind of what Rose is doing now. Like she's obsessed with Alan. She's doing what Alan says to help like the ne like next person. Right. And it's like it's happening again. And they did. They're doing that with Rose. Like Rose was kind of just she got possessed in the first game. She she had a crush on Alan and that was it. But she's becoming the Cynthia in this game. And it kind of has me thinking like, they, is this a loop too? Like, are we just mm. in a loop over and over just with bigger, bigger pair like variations instead of just like a loop of a of a sewer where like just a giant loop <laughs> of the same thing happening right. over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I do wish they would clarify why they also call Alan Tom sometimes. Yeah. Like, obviously they're like one of the same, but I'm like, like, uh, can we speed up this explanation, please? <laughs> Play to the game. Uh, yeah. I like that they had, uh, that she still had that Alan Wake standee from the first game too. That was in the diner. Yeah. But that's like sitting over there. That's cute. Like at course. her place of work. <laughs> Like, maybe have that I, at home. Everyone has so many jobs in this town, too, by the way. Like, Rose does the diner and the nursing home. Like, how does she have time? Yako and Ilmo have, like, Coffee World and then the float business. And then Trailer they parks, have, like, yeah. their... Yeah, there. But then I this is this right. is my meta moment. Is when we, when I first met Ilmo and Yako, there was another NPC staring off into the sea, into the like the the flood, and he was like, he said like idle idle hands are the devil's playthings. And I was like, are Ilmo and Yako so busy and Rose so busy? Does that keep, does that help keep them from like the darkness that seems to like get everybody else who's just kind of standing around most of That's the time? Interesting. Like the only people who are working seem to be the ones that aren't affected by the story. Hmm. Dang. Mm. I like that as an idea for sure. Especially with Alan having writer's block. Not right. Not do anything. It's just lazy mm -hmm. SOB. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is Sarah getting into the lore? Wait a you minute. Guys, I, heard an NPC, I overheard her. an NPC. <laughs> <laughs> you were listening to those guys? <laughs> that NPC is awesome. He's like a construction worker staring at the broken bridge and he's yeah. like, why do we build anything? <laughs> I felt, I really, I really related to that NPC. <laughs> yeah, that, that's an awesome character in 2023. That guy gets <laughs> it, man. <laughs> oh, this game's many awesome meta NPCs. I really like that one. <laughs> I do like, um, I like how expressive Rose is. I don't know if mm -hmm. what's going on. The animators are just having the most fun with her because she, she is such like an over the top the character. Eyes. Yeah, there's a lot she's going like, on in her she's face. Got crazy and, eyes. She's, and you're like, please, Rose, <laughs> don't look at me. <laughs> uh, Ryan says uh, it's so wild that almost every drawer in the nursing home had handgun and shotgun bullets inside, <laughs> and that the residents didn't object at all to me stealing them, even when they were right in their rooms watching me rummage through their stuff, stealing everything. <laughs> You're taking their pills and just slowly, like, <laughs> pocketing them. Yeah, Mandy May was like, I'm doing an exercise to better my joints, and I just stole her joint medication. Yeah, <laughs> well, I forget who it was. I need this more. I really like the animation, too, of uh, the old woman that was, like, knitting. 
It's like really good hand mm-hmm. animation on that. Yeah, video. that one was there. Mandy May. Is that right? Donna okay. was the one in the workout tracksuit. Right, into it. right. A little I more feisty. I think that was the point where the game passed the Bechtel test because she asked her about her knitting. Mm, wow. That's true. Because wow. like she keeps knitting that like not quite a scarf, not quite a blanket. Yeah. And when I first saw her, she was at Ati's concert, and I was like, "What is this woman knitting? Like this isn't this isn't a shape." Like, do we think that the length of Mandy May's scarf is how many loops they've been stuck in? Like she just keeps knitting. Sarah. And her hands were like bloody at one Sarah. point. Sarah. Yeah. Hire me, Remedy. <laughs> <laughs> I can give you some ideas. Because, yeah, she just she doesn't know that. what it is. She's like, I don't know what it is. I've just been knitting. And once again, it's like the idle hands are the devil's play thing. Like Mandy Mae just doesn't stop knitting. Move your hands, everybody. Sarah, I love it. Move your hands. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. I got it. Saga, move your hands. <laughs> Uh, Brian Stanley writes in and says, I played this spooky game with headphones on for my playthrough. What spooked me the most uh, in the entire game was that the annoying black and white scratches of nearing dark forces to interrupt gameplay. No, it was the water cooler on the second floor of the Valhalla nursing yes. home. <laughs> Every time that thing glugged when I walked by, I'd be spinning around in a panic looking for an enemy that was not there. <laughs> yeah. That was my fly. <laughs> Ampex uh, also yeah talks about like that connects to just the fear of like overall haunted water is like even the the bubbler as Sarah would say uh, even that's nice. scary in this environment I would say that yeah I know you would you never stop it uh, Darren Dillinger writes in and says I'm glad to read Barry Wheeler revive the old god's rock career like he said he would in Alan Wake 1 the constant water dripping sounds is thanks to Barry too. We learned that Barry uh, bought the manor for Tor and Odin, but the contractors he hired ran off with the money. I also learned a new idiom from Ati about heavy rain. It's coming down like rain from the ass of Asteri. It probably sounds better in Finnish, says David. Uh, okay, yeah. Who's Barry Wheeler again? Is he the agent? Yeah, hey. he's he's been friends with Alan since they've been kids, so they're like long-term friends, but then he became his agent as he got older, and then... Uh, He's kind of like the jerk you love. Like, that's his character. I very much feel like he's like Roman in Grand Theft Auto 4. He's like, hey, I'm kind of annoying, but you love me. And you're like, oh, Barry. He's yeah. like very realistic. Like, he wears Christmas lights in the first game, which is so smart. He's just like, what are you guys doing? Put Christmas lights on. It's They don't touch me. And you're like, that's so smart. Like, and shake your hands. Come on, you idiots. It's right there. <laughs> Uh, and I like that he's so sweet in this one. Like you can read emails where he's reaching out to Alice and that's trying to like it. Yep. and protect mm-hmm. his integ- like protect his image after they think he died. And he really yeah. cares. And and it's nice because in the first one they kind of tease that he's he, maybe he's just money hungry and he's just using his childhood friend to make money. And then this one kind of redeems him. It's like no, he loves Alan. Like he he's refusing money to make sure that a stupid zombie video game doesn't get made with Alan's likeness in it. Like, I thought that was nice. That was yeah. so funny. Like, God forbid this becomes a video game. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. I know this is the game that wants us to ask, but do you guys think that they did turn it into a game and that's what we're playing? Do you think that's what's I happening? I wouldn't hate that. Okay. Switch at the end. Right. I do tend to kind of like that stuff. I feel like I don't even um, need to be a I would switch. say it's that we kind of saw it coming, but it wouldn't be the worst. If that is the reveal, it'll get revealed in Alan Wake like 13, though. Uh-huh. No! <laughs> not getting it at two. No, but I like that Who's even... Who's playing it? Logan? Logan's playing it. Ooh. Yeah, With that second controller. Oh, And that's Leo. why you hear her it's whenever like plugged. Saga's in danger, which is mm-hmm. really annoying. Like whenever Saga gets around water, Logan pops up and I'm like, get out of here. You're not... At- it's not even you. <laughs> we don't like you. <laughs> Tell us about that episode of Night Springs or get out, frankly, Logan. Uh, Ryan T writes in and says last episode y'all talked about how the oldest house from Control was similar to the world tree Yggdrasil from Norse mythology in this chapter we get a lot more connections to that with Tor and Odin's characters do you think these connections are meant to be interpreted purely as illusions or are they more literal in a Neil Gaiman American God sort of way that's what I was I was like asking my chat about it is like how serious are we taking like the North Norse mythology or is it sort of just like cool names like highlighting that they're probably interesting important characters but they're yeah hmm. and i think there's so much in this about like <clears throat> things echoing like if not directly looping it's like this event this significant thing has ramifications from the power of the idea of it that's something that's yeah. consistent in control and in this and i feel like that might be all there is to it is just like these resonant things with mythology because these are such powerful stories that they kind of keep occurring or keep having impact without it being like, like that. yeah, that was this. That was literally Yeah, because they that. call the cult of the tree a backwoods echo of the cult of the word. Like they're 
They're not right. different. They're just like how a different area with less access to information perceives that cult. Like, you know, that's, in- I like that. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I do like that scene of when you profile Odin for the first time and then he's in the chair talking to you and there's like a live action uh, saga looking really confused about what's going on and all this stuff. Like yeah. that's such a fun twist. Like when you think you're in the rut of like, all right, profile, got it, got it, got it. Then suddenly it's like, nope, Tor and Odin, they're just going to be hanging out there in a completely different way. They're on to you completely. I like that you're not alone in being special, mm-hmm. but it's not that you're like, I don't like, cause it's like, she's not quite a Mary Sue, right? Cause Tor and Odin are also their own Mary Sue's. They're just a little <laughs> Marty too old. Stews. Like they can't, it's more <laughs> Marty Sue's. But it's like, they, I like how they're like, we could do it, but we're just like, Really old and like dude, falling apart here. So we just like to drink to and, and rock. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and yeah. Exp- that's be- on saga. Talking about saga's live action actor not being in mm-hmm. it very much. Suddenly seeing her there. Yeah, that made me think like maybe there is some big turn coming where we're suddenly going to get a lot of that. I feel like there's they're so. kind of holding back, and that's my prediction for for the final part here. Is we'll get a get a I'd big boatload. That. Yeah, yeah. I forget when it is, but there's one section just in the live action world where there's some section of this where you're going through a cave and like the exit of the cave is one of the brothers is like live action faces. I thought that was such a cool idea of like coming out of the cave and the faces right there. Um, let's see. Uh, Taylor Wagon uh, writes in and says, I really like the reveal that Saga's powers are a trait that she shares with her family. If not only, it not only gives a great in universe reason for her mind place abilities outside of just being another unique para utilitarian. It also explains why the two old rockers are uniquely able to influence the events and stay one step ahead of being taken for so long. It's something I've been wondering since I played Alan Wake one for the first time. It's a great payoff to a long time question for fans. Absolutely. Yeah. And so they explain that the clicker, it's just an amp. What do they say? You say you can play rock and roll without it, but you won't blow anybody away. <laughs> it's like, Oh, okay. Sure. You've got to explain the clicker in a convenient way. Sure. We'll take yeah. that. Um, and then he, he's talking about Tom's writing and then Saga immediately clicks like, oh, by Tom's writing, Odin's talking about Alan Wake. Okay. It's overlapping it more. Um, then uh, we get the key to the wellness center. And that's where things get uh, <laughs> even creepier. I love that it's like, it's so tropey, right? Like there's always a hospital. There's always like a lab. But yeah. this is a old person's <laughs> retirement home wellness center and you're like how is this still terrifying like you see the exercise <laughs> balls you see like the old person like little stair yeah. thing to train them not to fall downstairs yeah i'm fighting for my life <laughs> train them not to fall downstairs and like, and like the ambient music too when you're in that wellness center is just like picking up so much and this is one of those where I was playing it at like one in the morning in the basement. I'm like, is it just late and I'm a complete coward? Or if I was playing this during the day, would I also be shitting bricks? Because this section really, really got me like Resident Evil 2 remake level of scared, I think, playing through this chunk here. Yeah. Just constant jump scares. Like it was oh. just Cynthia screaming at you every time you entered a door frame. <laughs> I was doing everything like to I could to put off going into Cynthia's room. Yeah. Which is mm-hmm. a good sign that the horror is really working. It's like, okay, have I done everything? <laughs> uh yeah. Uh let's see. Alfredo says I'm a coward when it comes to jump scares. No, the first game had a few. I didn't expect Alan Wake 2 to feature so many, but it went wild in this chapter. I got so anxious that I had to play the game in a tiny window in my computer on top of a colorful Animal Crossing desktop oh my wallpaper God. with mariachi music playing in the background to subdue <laughs> the horror and give me the courage yes. to push through. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Great problem solving, truly. Uh, and then Boondock <laughs> Bandit said, uh, yeah, at one point I was playing a background YouTube video playing the game in my periphery vision with my hands and legs partially blocking the screen just so I could get through it. <laughs> I yeah. just sing what I see. Like, whatever I walk in front, I sing a song about it, and then it's stupid, so then it's not scary. I've done that since I've been a little kid. Just like, okay, there's a shadowy figure over there. Okay, music's yeah, picking like, I'm up. I'm walking in a room, and there's a table. Oh, it's knocked over. Who did that? I think I'm going to know. <laughs> ha ha, walk over here. Like, just do that enough, and then, yeah. like, if something happens, you're like, ah! I'm still running. It like interrupts the fear a bit. I just like get mad now. Like I just start swinging. Like the minute I can tell, like I find it easier to just like run headfirst and do it screaming with anger than like trying to tiptoe my way around it. Yeah. Jonathan Valdez writes in about like, yeah, this this section in particular feels so Resident Evil. Like even Mm -hmm. though I guess you go to a police station pretty soon that's also a little Resident Evil 2 section you know it's still this entire area it just feels so so Resident Evil for sure uh, James Altman says I love the fact that they keep 
playing with her expectations of enemies possibly being around every, any corner in this chapter. By the time I made it into the basement, I was practically inching along, gun drawn, mm -hmm. waiting for the inevitable, only for there to be zero enemy encounters down mm -hmm. there. You got me, mm -hmm. Remedy. You got me. And to be the really entire room yeah. with the tunnel, too, that you can climb through, I was like, this is Resident Evil. Like, something's going to come slowly walk through the water. Yeah. They'll have to use the echoes of their pitter-pattery footsteps to crawl through the tunnel. And I literally, like, I crept the entire section because, like, I was like, something's going to happen. It's and then brutal. nothing yeah. did. And I was like, yeah. glad it didn't. But I was also like, I can't believe you made a fool of me. <laughs> I, I definitely jumped around the um, the washing machines, and mm -hmm. and I don't. It, there was like some ambient noise or something, and that was it. And I was like, I am getting out of here. Go. <laughs> oh. They had like footsteps of people walking upstairs too, like probably oh. just the residents like hanging out. It's not supposed to be scary, but like mm -hmm. hearing footsteps when you're in your basement is always scary. So the fact I love that, that all the old folks people. were on the porch at this time too. They were like, yeah. Auntie told us to just sit here and wait." And they don't know what's going on. Meanwhile, like Saga's in the back with a rifle out, like kapow, kapow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did um, we haven't really talked about like how enemies talk in this game and just the strange things they say? Alan Wake. Well, there's that, I suppose, but it's interesting. Like, I think, like you know, there's some water yeah, reflection. Yeah, fu funny later. how all all the enemies in the Alan Wake segment are always saying Alan Wake. As he walks, it's Woo, just like we love you're so still focused okay. on him, Jeff. Um, you're still in the mindset that there could be a flaw in this game. <laughs> it's all part of it. Oh, you're right. You're Let right. Let that part <laughs> die. Let it turn. Uh, no, but like, like just you know, there's somebody who jumped out at a certain point, and they're like. Uh, sign sealed delivered or something and then there's some point <laughs> where a lady jumps out here and she just goes top 100 american small towns <laughs> just attacking did that really happen <laughs> yes yeah they just they I say feel like, like I, I miss it because i play on like story mode so it's like shoot first and usually they're dead before <laughs> they can even get the words out they just say kind um, of surreal things from their lives or from the environment and stuff yeah it's like they're cool like fun. still in there i think is the insinuation they just yeah. are, have been taken so they're trying to just like be themselves and scream whatever the last thing they said was. Yeah. I don't know. Someone in the chat had said that one of them just yelled, Deer Fest is canceled. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, Tim the scariest in. thing you could hear. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, listen, do you want scary stuff, Leo, or do you want a fun detail? Fun detail. Boo! <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Colleen writes in they say when you enter the wellness center you find a small pharmacy room as a pharmacist I always like to see what fake drugs the developers invent Spider-Man 2 had a drug, drug called Salbutamol uh, <laughs> I was surprised to see that the game included real drugs with accurate names, dosages, packages sizes, expiration dates lot numbers and NDC numbers this Amazing. may not mean much to people outside of healthcare, but I've never seen this much detail in such a small set dressing like that, and I loved it. They did it for That's you, so Colleen. Great. Congratulations. Nice. And the NPCs don't talk with all the drugs. Yeah. Accurate labels. <laughs> <laughs> and there's flies trapped in the windows and dust on the VCR. Oh, perfect gaming. Tim writes in and says, I never found any of the random jumps here as scary. Uh, Close-ups of Alan says, slash scratch particularly scary at all however the cynthia one sent shivers up my spine several times something about Sivia, cynthia and those jump scares like that's that's it i think they she changed them scary. like i think the other ones were a little more like see-through like opaque think so? usually they weren't yeah, yeah i think so they the, the cynthia ones were altered in a way that made them scarier they send you none the, of the other ones, ones you. when you're relaxed also. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. the scratch ones come when you're sure. already kind of like... Hey. You're running through the forest and the red, like the haunted like house lights are on and everything. The Cynthia yeah. one is like, I was just chilling by this door. I was talking to I was, an elderly man. I was looking man. at her feet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was just looking at her feet. Like she was like, I was like, I Cynthia, where's your lamp. shoes? I was trying to be nice to her and I was. I turned my flashlight on for her when she was like, I miss my light. I was like, here, queen. I turned my light on and she <laughs> screamed in my face. I was like, no, I hate you now. Never mind. <laughs> uh, Jacob Schumer says, this is the first chapter where I really felt like not playing Alan Wake 1 would be a major detriment. If you played Alan Wake 1, you know that Cynthia as the lamp lady slash lady of the light, the analog of the light lady, who was a hero of sorts and played a central role in the story, and it was part one of the most iconic scenes of the game. Uh, part of one of the most iconic scenes of the game. Uh, it made her story here, how she descended into darkness because Zane's lamp was taken from her, so much more tragic. You can read about it in Alan Wake 2, but it's not nearly the same as experiencing it yourself. 
It really I bummed disagree. me out. I think you're I'm just trying to rationalize having to play Alan Wake 1. <laughs> whoa, whoa. <laughs> Turns out that was a really good idea. I am smart. <laughs> no, I think, Haley, I think you do have a better appreciation of Cynthia. Yeah, she, she was kind of, she was like a little beacon of hope at the end there. Because she, she kind of shows up. Well, you see, she was the one, she leaves these little packages for you all throughout the game and, and uses glow in the dark paint that only shows up when you flash your flashlight. So she's been helping you the whole game. And at the very end, she's like, I have something you really need. And she has set up these tunnels that are just filled with like Christmas lights so she can get around and know she's never going to be touched. She's fully aware of what's happening. So she's this like breath of fresh air when everyone else is like taken and she's just smart. And she's set herself up at this water reservoir has lights like a million lamps. Her place where she lives is so cool because all she's done is just buy 8,000 8, lamps and the, her whole life is just changing the light bulbs. She has like a list of how long each light bulb lasts and she has so many of them. She's constantly going around and switching them out. Like that's her characterization. And I thought that was so like, that's what I would do if I was in a world where if I'm not in the light for one second, you get killed. So I'm like, oh, hell yeah, I relate. And like, she comes across as crazy, but Sis is alive and didn't get taken and she's living yeah, her life. Yeah, but look what happened to her. She, she lost She turned her into a monster and we fought and I won. Yeah. <laughs> she got shot in her nighty. Like, she had the like light after bulbs, all that work. the fuses is the problem. Yeah, after That's all that problem. work, she still succumbed to the darkness. But she probably yeah. got to like make out with Tor or whatever. They had a hot and heavy, steamy affair. Oh, that's so. true. That yeah. was it's confusing <laughs> that they were like, she seduced him and she's like, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like with what? <laughs> Her nighty. <laughs> like, what is she throwing back? Like, is it the bare feet? Like, does Tor have a foot thing? And, like, he was just chasing after them toes? Like, what was going on there? <laughs> They're great theories. <laughs> I did, All she had to do was take her shoes off. He's been bewitched. It's interesting, guys. Like, you're running down to the boss fight. You're just hearing Tor be like, oh, I deserve this. Like, oh, what have I done? Like, I, I, did you, is there more meaning to that, Haley? Of, like, yeah, why Tor was so seduced or like his guilt over it and all that stuff did you read more into that i mean there are few one of the few characters that are very self-aware like they know what's going on yeah like those kind of characters are far in between they stopped the second awe which we don't have a lot of information about so thomas zane stopped the first one they stopped the second one and then alan wake stopped the third one and hmm. there's a big mystery about like what was the second awe but we just know that tor tor Noden stopped it mm -hmm. so they clearly know the rules and they know how to stop things and they've been aware of this the whole time so i think the fact that he got tricked so easy he was like oh damn it like i knew it was <laughs> going on and i still freaked up like sorry yeah kind of energy instead of just like I, what's happening this woman is now evil he's like i knew this would happen i just wanted to get some from, from i love all the I people guess. in the old <laughs> folks home gossiping about it too they were yeah. like oh tar like he's got a big thing for cynthia now like can that, you believe oh, it that'd be so exciting though to be in an old folks home it'd be like in high school again like ooh, they're hooking up like mm -hmm. th that's yeah. gonna be the talk of the town well have you heard that like like stds are rampant in old folks homes because they all sleep honestly with each you, other. You yeah. yeah you can't walk into an old folks home without just seeing old people just banging in hallways and stuff like it's everywhere it's a crazy thing I stds and awe <laughs> <laughs> Leah, would you want me to make this shirt for you? No, please. Uh, Worth three twenty says the Cynthia boss fight was when I realized I think the game struggles with bosses. I find the boss fights to be more chaotic and hard to parse than difficult. For Cynthia, I spent the fight being thrown around by her waves, sort of tore, and it would get up to shadows chasing me. I made it hard to track her at times and know when I had a moment to heal or attack. Um, yeah, I also had a tough time with this boss fight. Her flailing running at you, it was like the scariest animation they have in this whole game where she's just mm -hmm. the moment where you knock yeah. her down and she's in the water and then she just comes at you because you can yeah. dodge four times in a row, but eventually she's going to hit you unless you just run. You can't just stand your ground. You have to just be like, <laughs> like, let the old woman chase you for five minutes until she gets tired and then shoot her. <laughs> what did we think of the part immediately before the boss fight where she's yeah. chasing I was just you from the water? Say that was really just full weird. on jaws. Because it yeah. didn't yeah. feel it didn't feel like well fleshed out to me. Yeah, like it felt like they were like, okay, we put water in here, so we need a little water part. Because like in Amnesia, they did it really well, where you mm. could kind of hear it like plotting behind you. But in yeah. this one, I it was just like Shamu came out of the water and knocked me <laughs> over, and then like swam off. 
Yeah, you figure out the rules really quick where it's just like, oh, I I get in the water and one and a half seconds later, exactly every time you start to hear it coming after you. Yep. And so every time you pulled it off, it felt cool. But then every time it got just like, all right, this is nonsense. And so yeah, there was one time where I barely got away and I so barely got away that I could see her in the foreground (laughs) of the camera between the camera Mm -hmm. and Saga. I saw her go sailing past. (laughs) Yeah, every 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 now and then. As you're do running you all, up on something, it's like. <laughs> do you all have siblings? I'm just curious. Like, do you have siblings? Yeah. Is it like, do you want to play mermaids? No, like when your siblings are chasing up the stairs, that like very oh, much. Oh yeah. Up, like where you're like, <laughs> and you like just barely pull up, and it's like, okay, grounders, I'm safe. You can't touch me. Like that's that whole section felt like <laughs> my brother chasing me up the stairs and then like pushing me over at the top. Right. <laughs> 100 American small towns. Uh, let's see who's this. Dylan Kelly says the flooded bunker. Wow. Earlier this year, my girlfriend and I spent some vacation time in Washington. We explored a few coastal abandoned bunkers there. Sweet. Oh. They're not quite Did as you in- learn nothing from this game where they said people drowned in those? <laughs> well, they had a good time. <laughs> They're not quite as intricate as what you see in the game, but the way certain things rust, how water builds up and cracks start to show, the graffiti from local teens, and the fact that they use it as a party place is spot on. One of the bunkers we went to in was exactly that. A twisted tea cans, graffiti tags, and debris everywhere. They really nailed that uncomfortable vibe of wandering around in wet, ancient concrete. Mm-hmm. Concrete, yeah, nice. for sure. It's, so the idea of like, oh, a little girl named Nora drowned in this back in the day. I was going to bring that up because there's a lot of women drowning in this game, considering Logan drowns, this Nora person drowns, and Cynthia in Alan's hotel sequence is also drowning in a bathtub. What is going on here? I guess because the dark place is in a lake. It's kind of mm-hmm. like when you die, you go into the water. Maybe it's just that's their connection. But yeah, the witch also drowns. Yeah. Barbara drowned. What's going on here? Well, I thought Alice it, drowned. There's something about like, you know, the idea that you can't, you have to be pulling these ideas from somewhere for the story. So is the idea that like the de- idea of Logan drowning is inspired by like this Nora girl drowning down here or by maybe some of those other characters drowning and it's all connected that way. Cause they don't really Could say be. how she drowned. Do they? There's like, she drowned. <laughs> and you're like, they did how? say that. They did say that. They wouldn't stop saying it. The, well, the phone call where he's like, she almost drowned in the shower. Right. Right. But is that mm-hmm. where she drowned? Like he just flipped it so that she drowned there or yeah. Did she drown? Took Nora's place and drowned. I don't know. She drowned when they were living in, like watery together in the yeah. trailer. I I think that maybe she was Nora and they crossed her name out and wrote Logan. Because mm. Nora drowned because she was in the bunker and then the water came in. Yeah. That's, I mean, I'm just trying to rationalize it because like no, there's think, a lot I of women that's drowning. Right. I think that's it. At this point. Um, let's see. Uh, you also find the newspaper in the scary basement about Thomas Zane starting the commune near Bright Falls and how he wants to build a hotel called the Ocean View Hotel and all that stuff. Uh, so you get a little more dashes of Thomas Zane in there. Um, Kevin K writes in and says, I love the whole chapter. You're looking for the song Angler's Remorse. And then at the end of the chapter, you actually get to hear it. The perfect mixing of media is awesome. that the game really excels at. It is cool for that to be the, the goal. The songs are so rad. I, oh, they're all good. They're all, I'm, I'm, they need to do a vinyl release, please. Uh, I'm 8-bit. Come on, I'm 8-bit. Come on, I'm 8-bit. And also restock the thermoses because those sold out in like eight seconds. Did they I'm really? The, the, yeah. Oh, dear diner. I couldn't get one. <laughs> Oh, God, somebody had, oh, somebody said something silly about the diner. Oh, here it is. Uh, Hunter B wrote in on Patreon. They say, I'm not sure if I'm the only one to have this experience, but hearing the crew talk about the diner brought it up in my mind. When I walked into the Oh Dear Diner for the first time in Alan Wake 2, I was wondering where I'd seen it before. I hadn't played Alan Wake 1, so I don't think that was it. (laughs) Then it clicked for me. I remember that it was from Deadly Premonition. I recognized a diner from a game that was copying a diner from Twin Peaks that Remedy <laughs> copied for Alan Wake 2. It was a really weird experience. <laughs> oh, man. I started watching Twin Peaks. Oh, really? It's, yeah, it's really good. I, it's so weird to watch it, though, knowing that the reason it's familiar is because everyone else copied it. Like, it feels right. like those things inspired this new show I'm watching super late in my life because I'm dumb instead of this <laughs> thing inspiring most other crap I like like even like the the songs I was like this is the Night in the Woods theme, theme song it sounds oh, like funny. so like clearly yeah. Night in the Woods like ex- extremely inspired by this I love Night in the Woods I'm like this is Alan Wake the show I love Alan Wake it's just like weird that I've never watched it even though yeah 
in a weird way, I'm like drawn to it through all this other types of media of people that like it. It's been very odd to watch it in a good way. Did you know that Link's Awakening was inspired by Twin Peaks too? <laughs> like literally, Twilight Princess. No, oh, but wait, Link, actually... Link's Awakening. Literally, like Tezuka said, like uh, yeah, it was a real inspiration. As we were all watching Twin Peaks, we we're like, let's make a weird Zelda world, and that was Link's Amazing. Awakening and Surreal Island. There, just everything's inspired by this, I guess. That's it. Uh, in the song you hear at the end of chapter four, I forget if it's Saga or Alan, but there's a lyric that is Lynch catching fish. It's a recurring theme. Capital L Lynch, which is the first time I think they've explicitly put his name in the game for all the references there are. Oh, oh OK. Oh, OK. Um, Dixon Denham <laughs> writes in and says, ever since the F the government commercial where Ilmo revealed we have bolt cutters. I have been stuck in my own mind place trying to figure out what mm -hmm. connects the Haskella brothers to those darn things. Why were they hiding them? What dark truth is behind all the chained up stuff down, uh, chained up doorways? Were the cutters an object of power that are only, that are the only way to sever their twisted twinly bond? For Saga to unceremoniously find them locked up in the flooded bunker like any other tool. Please. <laughs> that did feel a little like yeah. a let down. Yeah. yeah. But, we should have got their I, one. Yeah. I, I I was just like, heck yeah, finally I got the bolt cutters. Yeah, it is satisfying. I'm, I'm going around. I'm going to snip so Do many chains Do we have to now. go back now before we proceed into like chapter seven and bolt cut everything? Or because there was like all that lock stuff. Too. That's the fun. Now if you I'm like, do, do I have it? to go back? Uh, I, I do think Damn. it was a smart idea of you get the bolt cutters and then it's like, oh, here's the door. Use it. And you're so excited to finally use it. And you're running over there. And then that's when the person bursts through the wall. Like they know that you're just like oh, yeah. laser locked on the actually using them. But... Then you zig. Uh, Darkfish Days writes in and says, "Did anyone else? Okay, this is this is we're getting we're getting deep, folks. You thought that was oh. deep before? Child's play." Darkfish Days says, "Did anyone else notice the clocks in towns and in the dark place are stuck at ten ten, three fifteen, or zero 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 zero? Wow. So so far, the Valhalla nursing home is the only place with working pendulum clocks." But most interestingly, when I first when I first went to Valhalla, the minute hand on the clocks matched my real world minute. 4:55 in the game, 8:55 in real life. And Thank the you. hands continued to move in real time, but only while the game was on. So when I returned another day, the times no longer matched. Was that first visit a coincidence or did Saga trigger something when she first entered the nursing home <laughs> as if her presence set the time itself? Wow, Remedy. Yeah, That's Sarah, wild. you want to take Done this one? Okay. <laughs> now we're going into we're getting into quantum physics. Like if something is perceived, it now brings it to real. Oh my uh -huh. god, remedy! Shout out to that person for paying attention to that. And I love that. that. Real. I love awesome. that. I remember it's some. Uh, it was on the uh, the second South Park RPG on that. Sarah, um, th three of us. I guess four of us used to work at Game Informer. And we used to go on like cover story trips. But on that, uh, did you go? To, did you go on one for Control? We did actually. Well, not for Control for Quantum Break though. For me, Leo was Control. Oh. I was a Quantum Break. This kind of we we're kind oh, of the, so the jealous. I'm jealous of you, bro. I'm jealous of you, bro. <laughs> Anyways, I remember on Fractured Butthole, the South Park game, they're talking about like that was a late thing in development. They're like, oh crap, we need to sync up all the clocks. I remember talking to a developer. It's like it's a surprisingly tough thing to do. It's like it's just because everyone puts that art up and they don't think about it. It's like, oh mm -hmm. crap, I guess we need to have this make sense. Someone needs to spend a day on syncing clocks up in this game world. <laughs> um, anyways, Luca A writes in and says, something weird and fittingly meta happened in Chapter 5, Old Gods. Uh, a few months ago, <laughs> I asked my sister who lives in the UK to buy a copy of Edge, the magazine featuring Alan Wake 2 as the cover art. Flash forward to this chapter featuring, featuring a password puzzle. The password turned out to be my sister's birthday. Whoa. As far as I know, this Ooh. is the only date password in the game so far. Talk about odds and oddities that elevate an otherwise regular gameplay moment. Remedy are truly masters of their work. Right, Sarah? <laughs> says Luca. <laughs> is that it what the is. comment says? Right, yeah. Sarah? It really does. Wow, it really now does. the comment's getting meta too. <laughs> I cannot escape. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. Uh, now we're in Saga Return 6, otherwise known as Scratch. Um, I do like the weird push and pull of the FBC calling the Taken the Shadow, and then Saga's always yeah. like, eh, they're, they're Taken. Like, just like that's like, no, actually, we have a name for those already, you guys, and your <laughs> district and your bureau don't need to come up with a new name for it. Uh, okay. Ooh. Yeah, Perry Utilitarians is not catchy enough. Guys. Yeah, it's not going anywhere, guys. I don't know what you're thinking. Um, yeah, this is the uh, police station thing, all that stuff. Uh, and then the brothers are locked up. Oh, I guess you see Alex Casey 
in here where it's a confusing thing where poor he was, Alex Casey. Can poor, someone explain why they were like Alex Casey was injured, so we put him back in the morgue where and, the scary man was. Sure, he's fine. Like he's and then he's so traumatized. And he makes you a little like in, barricade. I didn't even see him. <laughs> his head, I got his little head had to pop up, and I was like, buddy, what <laughs> happened? <laughs> Pinching his little cheeks. Yeah, <laughs> poor little Puffs kid. <laughs> Do you have a tissue? <laughs> <laughs> the cold got him. Uh, but yeah, it's that weird idea of like he's been exposed to the shadow or the Taken, but he's not turning. And I like there's that note that's like, is this part of like the Dark Presence's strategy or the Shadow's strategy is to deliberately not convert some people, even though they were so exposed. Like, it's a cool idea. I feel like Alex Casey isn't real is kind of my vibe I got from that. So he can't even get taken. Mm, mm. Yeah. Like he's, he's just written in, which makes sense because he's Alex Casey and Alex Casey is, is Alex's character. So it's like, very clearly a character. Right. Yeah. Clearly we're we're asking the right question. There's a, a note that's like, well, yeah, why didn't Alex get converted? Like, here's possible theories. Is he stronger or whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it, it is weird for sure. Uh, also, in terms of big mysteries, um, well, I guess we can unpack that in a, in a, in a second here. Um, but I love this as a stopping point for Saga, like having that boss fight uh, with Scratch. I mean, boss fight is kind of just running over and turning on the things and I guess just the slowing him down boxes. enough. This yeah. is control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I didn't even realize that. I play control. <laughs> I can tell. Very impressed. Aren't wow. you glad you did? Thank you. Yeah. Um, but I, I did like that sequence of like, I, I'm a sucker for when there's like a big character in a big moment and it's just fully interactable. And so I love just like actually walking down the little jail cells once you finally get in there and stuff and walking by the brothers and then just like walking up to Alan Wake in the prison. You know, it's like such a yeah. cool idea of like, oh my God, it's such a big thing. And I'm actually getting to walk up there myself. It's not just a cut scene of me going up there. And then I do love that scene. Yeah. Where the brothers it's are a like, video game, Ben, not a movie. What? Yeah. That's what I like. I, I like when you interact with like big characters in the real world. It's a small thing in games, but I love it. I feel that, especially with the the flashlight, pe- walking through there, peeking, putting the flashlight through the bars. Is this him? Yes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. There's something special about Gameplay, that. Maybe. Um, and then he turns into scratch and then. Kills one of the brothers, warps out, uh, and you fight him, and he just kind of warps away at the end. Ah, saga. I forget exactly how, what he says, how it all works. He, he yells, "Return!" Right, right, and then disappears. Okay, yeah, the but it, and so stuff hits him <clears throat> light, and then he's like, "Ah!" Right, yeah, because the, they have the, the tech ready to go. That was a cool idea. Yeah. When he warps out, am, am I right in understanding that he basically like? warps into the brother and is then wearing the brother's jacket. Oh, I missed the jacket thing. He wanted oh, strip. yeah. I was yeah. wondering where he got the leather jacket. He got it from Yako. Yeah. Interesting. I, I just thought I think he so, got which his is a cool pretty badass, up or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> pretty badass way of uh, warping out. <laughs> that's, that's so funny because if you're, if you're he, gonna could do just, it. he could just have killed him, but he's like, and your jacket, please. Like, he didn't have to do that. Yeah. He just wanted to make Alan look like a jerk in a leather jacket. In, in that moment, I already loved him so much more than Alan Wake. I was I was sold. <laughs> Team Scratch. <laughs> uh, Gara writes in and says, Dark, Twisted, and Cruel featuring Pale Face is a bop. But like it is hilarious, right? Like an over dark parody. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It was giving. It was giving. Like I'm in middle school and I listen to Evanescence. Yes. I am yeah. the darkness. Like <laughs> you cannot even like fathom the amount of darkness that is within me <laughs> at this that, very moment. That song was written by Alan Wake. I'm sure. I in my notes <laughs> I had it written as Alan Wake DK rap super lame. My, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Drake H also writes in about it saying the disparity between the quote. I am the knife cutting your blouse and I don't say please really paints a picture of scratch. This might be an unpopular opinion, but I'm going to say this scratch guy seems like a real jerk. <laughs> I did notice when he asked for the clicker that he didn't say please. Mm. And I was like, that's pretty rude of you. Must yeah. be scratch. Monster. <laughs> that's how you know. If it says, mm. if he says please, it's Alan. <laughs> Chris McMullen writes in and says, with the revelation of Saga's supposed family history, how much do you think is fact and how much is fiction. We talked about it already. Um, but Odin claims that the Andersons can't have their memories altered by the Dark Presence. And that seems to line up. Also with the note saying that Fat Bob Balder was a member of the old gods of Asgard and Saga's mother being Freya. I'm guessing that Saga's dad is... Somebody else have a guess of where this is going? I thought it was Dor. I thought it was Dor too. Oh. 
Interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. Are we not on the same page here? I didn't. What What is leading that up? I didn't connect that at all. Yeah, me neither. In the, oh, what is it? Initiation five, six, whatever. There, there's a scene with Alan Wake talking to Door, and Door says like, hey, you're like, you're messing with crap that you don't understand, and you're you're affecting someone who I care very much about. Oh, geez. All right. That seems huge. Or something yeah. something along those lines. Okay. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And when you go to the nursing home and you see, like, the portrait of Saga's family on the wall, yeah. Odin gives you, or, like, Tor, someone gives you backstory about how they don't like Saga's father and how yes. he's very much, like, messing with a bunch of things that he shouldn't be. He's, like, in a lot of different places. He was never around. Yeah. He's always so going through those. Yeah. So he wouldn't have... She. She got powers from Dor, but then how come Thor and Odin have the same powers if they're not? I think she got the Anderson powers. I don't. I don't know if she has. She Dor's must have powers. something extra from Dor. Oh Dor's yeah, and like literally, Thor says when Saga asks about her dad, Thor says some doors should remain closed. Ah, uh, and that was like ding, 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 ding. Uh, come on, guys! I thought you guys were Alan Wake. What do you mean, Jeff? Am I picking up on this? I was. Well, <laughs> people, I was in, the, people, people in the chat are saying that's from Initiation Seven, so maybe I. <laughs> I, I missed the <laughs> what the stopping point. Come on, yeah, she's cheating. Uh, yeah, but uh, Chris McMullen was just saying that his guess was that is that her dad was going to be Loki, and and they say whenever okay. she's done doing a profile, the shadow of the deer head behind her gives her antlers like Loki. Also, yeah. the follow of the mm. family was uh, Tor pushing I her thought- father away, all that stuff. Good read. Here's what I've been going off of because like Alan's the owl, so he's owlin. And Saga's the deer, and she's Ann Deerson, which is how I've been, like, separating them mentally. So, like, oh, it's Owlin, because he's an owl, right. Ann Deerson, because she's a deer. And that's how, that's that's how it goes. That's <laughs> But... <laughs> But the Anne you might Deer, be totally right. Yeah, but she has a daughter, so it'd be Anne Deer daughter, technically, I think. That's her last Low name. Low gun? Loaded Ooh, gun. Words of gun. <laughs> words of logan uh hey uh this is a good time to, to something here to, to jump Sorry. into <clears throat> you guys remember alan initiation four that chapter called we sing hold on real quick yeah, Shipper, I'm so glad we in the saved Twitch it. Chat says her daughter is a gun i think that's really interesting <laughs> <laughs> can you drown a gun <laughs> I think you gotta read Rusty. lower it. Let's skip this chapter. I don't want to talk about this chapter. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's move on. We've got some more things <laughs> Sarah should pay attention to. Uh, no, we have uh, We Sing, of course, uh, our favorite Nintendo game. I love that it sounds like a Wii game. It really <laughs> does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I wish it wasn't that people weren't teasing it so strongly. I feel like I I'm not even scrolling on Twitter, but I still feel like I got enough of people being like, there's one chapter that if you like Ashtray Maze, I bet you're really going to like. It's like, okay, all right, I got I, it. I didn't, so you're scrolling too much. So. Oh, nice, nice, oh, nice. I'm totally blind. It Wa- was so great. Yeah, walk me through your evolution. When did you realize like how, how thorough it was going to be? <laughs> I guess probably the second person who's doing the, the choreography. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, we're probably going to get through everybody, aren't we? I think this is and the then them all doing it at the end was a treat. A treat yeah. for the senses. Yeah. So if you didn't play the game, which I like you for listening this uh, long into Deepest Dive, if you haven't played the game, I am one of you. Um, and I understand you wouldn't need an explanation. What's happening here is this entire chapter is a musical a live action musical over a bunch of different scenes that you're walking through. It's not through. so much a musical as it's like a rock concert. It's, it's a rock like a concert rock that's a ballad. A, yeah, rock retelling rock the opera, story of Alan Wake re- 1. Which is a really impressive trick to pull off because it'll do a big a verse or whatever. And then there's kind of yes. going back down to the instrumental, the backbeat, as you spend more time, the an amount of time they can't really plan good. for. Yeah, uh, in this section, solving a puzzle, fighting enemies, or just making your way through it, and then it's still yeah. Doesn't like Tor or Odin something. like point up the stairs? Yes, I love they're always like yeah, they're that like, way. It's so fun. That's so fun. And I love like the stage directions too. Like there was one yes. that said stand here for guitar solo, and that's where yes. you would stand for the guitar solo while you were like rushed by the enemies. Yep, yep. Just and they literally so incredible. Yep, and the and fact that they had one like, of my favorite moments in gaming, and it's going to be all downhill ooh, from there. Wow! I, like I mean, like in of this year, but yeah. like it's going to be like the rest of the so game big. all downhill. I'm just thinking that it will be a tough competition for best moment. 
Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, two that times. wins. Michael Lane writes in. They say, uh, given that the sequence is a shoe in for moment of the year, it may be surprising <laughs> to find out that We Sing was almost completely cut out of Alan Wake 2. According to Sam Lake in an interview on the Friends Per Second podcast, he actually had to fight to keep the sequence in, seemingly because others at Remedy thought it'd be too unconventional, even for this game. Just have to say I'm so thankful for Sam Lake's vision and determination to get this chapter made. It's not only a standout moment of the game, but one of the most impressive sequences I've seen in a video game this generation. Whoa, people love musical sequences. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was so well executed. It was so really well done. And then I thought that it ended and I was kind of bummed. Yep. (laughs) And then like Alan like starts, he gets a little jazzy and he does a little two step. And I was just like, I like I had a smile on my face the entire time I was going through this. Like I was blown away. Yeah, like that's exactly it is. You wrap up a little segment and then Alan says, well, I didn't see that coming. It's like, okay, well, I guess that's the conclusion. And then you go through the next section and it's just Alan Wake on a mic and he just starts singing, such a dark place, am I trapped in here? It's like, okay, <laughs> round two, here we go. Um, and With the bassist playing like stand-up sounding bass. On yeah, the yep, yep, yep. Uh, Nora writes in, uh, got better from the drowning apparently. Uh, and she says, uh, this is already one of the, my favorite sections of the game. Maybe one of my favorites in gaming, the several false endings, the way Alan is reciting to it all. And to top it all off when you're back on the set of the talk show and think what a way to start off the chapter, uh, getting hit with that chapter. end as soon as you stepped out the doors is a uh, completely brilliant, mm-hmm. uh, Yes, most excellent. Like just the first thing where it's like the full panel of just like Sam Lake dancing. It's like, yeah, this is this is a pretty good game. I'm happy just sitting here <laughs> watching this guy dance for a little bit. And like, it I just was well choreographed. It, it really was, a was good dance. It just made me think of like everybody involved has to have so much faith in Remedy because I mean maybe everyone is just the hammiest mf on earth and they loved it. But like, can you imagine that idea of like? am I going to look like a complete jackass doing this? Like not having the context or seeing what it's like in the game, but just like recording all that stuff. Like just having faith that, all right, I know this team will put it together in a way that will be cool for people and not truly the dumbest thing that's ever been put in a video game. <laughs> and so these are actors you got to remember. Oh, I was trying to like, I was doing my remedy homework and I was trying to like read into the moves because they like put the crown on yeah. and then they like go through the woods. It's like very like Pretty modern. And and they, yeah. And then they do little like toe touches, you know, and I'm like, what's happening? Starkiller is exactly. What does it mean? Honest, it's Cynthia's, Cynthia's feet. feet. <laughs> Starkiller is exactly there with you, Sarah. Starkiller says, I haven't played any of uh, Remedy's other games. So I was wondering if anyone had any insight into what the toe touches symbolized. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just a bunch of feet stuff primarily. Um, the only thing that. I was up in my head about with this sequence. Awesome sequence, obviously, obviously. But there was a part of me that was like, how does this timeline work out for development versus like the Peacemaker intro? I don't know if anybody watched Peacemaker, uh, the DC show, because like the intro for that show is also just like choreographed sequence. and It's a very novel, yeah. charming thing, you know, but it's like, I hope that they were had this in the docket before that came around and it wasn't as clear of a line of like for the finale of this sequence in particular, like let's just kind of do the Peacemaker thing. I, I hope it predated I it. I, I think it, that's a that's an established tradition. It, you, yeah. I don't know if you remember, not that long ago, 10, 15 years ago, movies just ended with the characters dancing. Is that right? <laughs> they would just do a little dance at the end. Well, it's well, a lot of Bollywood. Now, but... If you watch any movie in Bollywood, they just <laughs> bring it back. They're just dancing. It's always better. <laughs> they got to figure it out. Uh, yeah, Tim, uh, Talk9 says it's one of the best moments in games for him. Absolutely. Uh, I'm a biggie boy. Says, I personally love the stage directions that allowed you to take part in the sequence, for better or worse. For example, it took me too long to understand that the neon escape sign was meant to guide you as you twisted and turned through the makeshift alleys, which was certainly frustrating. However, the tape marks guiding you otherwise, showing enemy placement, I do love it's like enemies and that big thing, and telling you to wait for a solo allowed me to choreograph the fight, fight sequences as to be as explosive as possible. Uh, shout out to the flare gun that cannot be using a legal amount of its combustive agent. <laughs> what a perfect way to introduce the flare gun is like this mm-hmm. big, like, mm-hmm. like the pyrotechnics of the show is you like, that's so fun. Like, yeah. but I, it's so much better than just like, here's a flare gun and here's three enemies clumped up. Oh, I get it. I shot them. But now it's like you time it with the music and it's choreographed and there's stage direction. And it's like, I'm in an interactive play, but I'm playing a game <laughs> like this. Oh, so good. Alfredo writes in says, I'm a big fan or a big mark for old gods and poets of the fall. So I was looking forward to what they would do in this game. And they went above and beyond. 
The musical is a clever way to catch people up on the story of Alan Wake. I recommend looking at the full screen live action videos on YouTube. There are a lot of small details you can miss in the game, like showing Alan's pugilistic incident with paparazzi in the first game, or the Taken replacing his flowers and wine for Alice with a handgun and a flashlight, then striking the chapter end pose from Alan Wake 1. They clearly had a lot of fun making it all. That's awesome. Uh, I loved. I would love to list, like, hear them talk about when they obviously met with like choreographers to be like, okay, here's how we want the scene to go. Here's what happened yeah. in our first game, and they had to be like, jazz hands, typewriter, da da da. That sequence. Rich McLaughlin writes in and says, "This is my favorite part uh, of the game." Uh, and afterwards, all I could think of was Sarah's voice saying, "Another choreographed combat musical." Yes, I see you, Remedy. I'm not saying she ruined it, but. They were imagining you not liking this game in this moment, apparently, Sarah, just so you know. I mean, this is, I will give them credit where credit's due. This is an incredible moment. But, Hell like, yeah. after this hits, what's okay. gonna, like, how do you recover from, like, this? You know, like, yep. after, like, that moment, how do you keep wowing me? I, I think you like, yeah. said that with the Ashtray Maze and Control, and, like, I thought that about the Ashtray Maze and Control right before this, which also is so fun, and this blows that out of the water. It's way better. Mm -hmm. Sarah, you you were, in my mind, you didn't like this, and I'm still waiting for an apology on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pretty Hate Machine says, is it hyperbolic to say that We Sing is one of the most unique and enjoyable gaming experiences? It might be recency bias, but I certainly felt that while playing it. That in itself is an achievement few games reach. Is there any discussion to be had about whether it might evolve the medium in some way? <laughs> I mean, I think... I don't know. I, it, I don't is know. this no, game I breaking... So. My question is, is this game breaking out of its bubble? That's my question. Hmm. Is it like... Is it really on fire, like, outside of the Alan Wake? People have already played the first one. People with the control. Or is it forever going to be this, like, underground thing where it's like, we all know that it was great. And we just hope that like game developers play it and then like put it into their own work. Knowing that I mean, it inspiring great. other artists will be something for sure. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. I think it has power that way. But you're right. I really have no idea how this game is doing. Yeah, I don't think they've released sales numbers quite yet, but I, I hope it's. I mean, it was what tied for most nominations for game awards. It helped that everybody he was playing the game. He said in some interview but. that he's been like super surprised at the success of the sales and stuff. So that mm. it's way more than they were anticipating, I think. Okay. Nice, that's nice. I do yeah, feel I like game nomination awards do not equal general interest from the no, public because that is no, like a yeah. very small media bubble. Yeah. And, and it feels like a lot of what they're doing here just is not going to be applicable to other games. A, a, Above and beyond, like, hey, let's have a musical number now. It's just like they have such a weird lore that they've built up in all these different games that can cross reference itself. Like, I don't know mm -hmm. that anyone else, like, mm -hmm. what other, you know, developer has enough franchises where it's like, yeah, let's get really meta with this and mix these yeah. universes together. Yeah. I That's think what dependent. we've learned this year with like Baldur's Gate 3 and Alan Wake is if you let developers do what they do well, in their own environment with like healthy boundaries and healthy, like it, it makes absolutely amazing games. Yeah. But it's also a matter of, I mean, Epic is funding this thing and right before the game launched or around the same window, they also laid off a, a boatload of people. So I wonder if Epic's in that phase of like, this is just that perfect pocket of them saying, all right, here's a bunch of money. Please make something cool. Fortnite's making a million dollars a day for us. And now, Suddenly, it's like okay, maybe they're not going to have quite the the full leash that they got for this, you know, for for other development teams. Um, but I think like in the in the big pantheon of musical sequences in games, I think this is going to be talked about. You know, it's interesting thinking about uh, Stray Gods this year, which I don't know if anybody else played, but like that the whole pitch for that game was like we want to make an interactive musical, and I feel like it didn't get that much fanfare. And then this segment from this game, everybody's talking about, but. You got to trick us into doing it. Right. I think that's it. <laughs> like, you know, people always love the sequence from Conker's Bad Fur Day back in the day on 64, like the Great Mighty Poo, which was another like big musical sequence. Like, if, it can be done right, you know? If it involves poop, it's done right. Um, uh, except for, for these people. Um, these people didn't like it. Uh, Beaten Down Brian says, this was the weakest segment of the game for me. Its conclusion felt purely as a result of how much people fawned over the ashtray maze. It worked in control because it was an empowering moment that arrived late in the game when Jesse could easily obliterate anything put in front of her. This arrives in Alan Wake's fourth chapter, which I started with eight bullets. I guess the flare gun was meant to be empowering, but when they only give you four yeah. ammo and it has a splash damage of a brick, it didn't really feel that way. You pick up a lot more ammo throughout it. Yeah. 
Uh, Connor that made Leo pretty grumpy. That comment. Come on, yeah, Brian. Yeah, it's cool because it was empowering it near the end. How about it's cool because it played a cool song <laughs> while you had fun? <laughs> I think that's what it was. What are you allergic to fun? Uh, yeah, Wait, Connor whimsy? beating down Brian about to be double beaten. Oh, <laughs> whoa! Uh, extremely beaten down. <laughs> Uh, Kenny Two Slice, we love you being number one. Thank you, uh, Kenny yeah, Two Slice you. and Connor. Um, they both wrote in saying like, yeah, the, the combat really was rough in this section. They didn't like it. Like uh, that's why you play on story mode. Like, let's not exactly, try to rationalize this exactly. combat. Like, let's just all play on story mode. Keep these comments coming. <laughs> <laughs> we can take Great it. It's fight. making us stronger. It's making us stronger. Uh, let's see. This person um, has nothing negative to say. Uh, Boondock Bandit says, related to the what musical is- sequence, in Saga's chapter Return 3, in the hotel rooms, you, hotel rooms, you can find a diary from Ed Booker, the local couple who ran into the cultists, uh, mentioning how being in Bright Falls inspired him to create a rock opera. I played Alan's musical sequence first, and reading this, it felt like Ed's rock opera inspiration bled into Alan's story. The FPC was already testing stories that come true with nursery rhymes, so this connection seems reasonable? Or am I off track? No, because he he's writing he writes the cult play that you're right. editing at the end, too. So I think they're like feeding off each other, maybe in a weird way. The fact that he's physically in Bright Falls writing might be like, yeah, bleeding into Alan. I didn't think about that. That's interesting. Wait, was there more with those two that like it almost feels like there's there's extra content out there that I just didn't run into during one of kind of the open things because because they there I think there were like maybe manuscript pages or something saying like okay the brother went back out into the woods and then the the sister I think or, there's something fishy about them that I hope gets resolved. Like the fact that this man, like the that they're both here, they're both one of the people that we can sort of like, what is it like profile? Mm-hmm. But yet mm-hmm. we don't really have a conclusion on them. Like the only thing we profiled them for is like that she stole a necklace. A little suspicious. Mm. Mm. Uh, Tim writes in and says, I was listening to the Triple Click podcast, and Jason Schreier confirmed with Remedy, Remedy that Lance Reddick was meant to play Mr. Door. He would have done an amazing job in the role, and I would have loved to see his take on the musical component in this chapter. That being oh, said, yeah. David Harwood did an amazing job, but yeah, can you imagine Lance Reddick dancing? That would have been sweet. That would have been good. Um, let's see. Kinardo uh, says, It struck me that giving the players the ability to switch between Saga and Alan, it will give us a certain level of editorial control over how the narrative plays out. I was waiting for the quote-unquote right moment to switch over to Alan, and after sticking with Saga all the way through fighting Cynthia Weaver, a sequence I found particularly harrowing, I was eager for a change of pace, so I switched to Alan and was rewarded with this. It couldn't have been a better fit for what the story needed at the moment for me. Uh, oh, I did the exact same order. thing. That's yep. a perfect order. <laughs> yeah, canon. It was ideal. Um, <laughs> do you all have a strategy for when you're swapping? I just like do one chapter, one person, one chapter, another person. Yeah. I, yeah, mm-hmm. I try to flip flop, but sometimes I can't find the bucket, so I just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bucket. Can't find my bucket to piss in, so yeah. I just keep running down the hallway. <laughs> We've all been there, sister. Uh, Then we get to Alan Initiation 5, room 665. Here we go, everybody. Uh, There's the billboard outside for the immersive play called The Cult. Um, And it's directed, yeah, by Ed Booker. And, yeah, put together the whole immersive experience, all that fun stuff. Um, Alex Casey runs into Alan Wake again. and That was so weird. And then we killed him? Right. You, like, shoot him in the gut? But he's like, Mm -hmm. he's saying the whole thing about like, oh, you and the writer are the same. You are the dark place, Alan, all this stuff. Um, But yeah, just one more run in with Alex Casey just to really kill him again, I guess. (laughs) Poor guy. (laughs) Can't catch a break. Green Bendy says, I was genuinely so sad when Alex Casey died for the second time. Uh, Holding a Beretta instead of his revolver and we weren't able to pick it up. I still see Alan doing slow-mo dives in my dreams. Yeah, we we all love Max Payne. He's the best. Um, let's Slow-mo see. Slow-mo dive, pointing a flashlight at a shadow. <laughs> cool. Steve Lucian says, I think this might be my favorite sequence of the entire game is the hotel sequence. The way the section makes use of Alan's storyboard mechanic is so well thought out, and the tension that reaches a boiling point at the end was almost unbearable. Also, if there's a better homage to The Shining and gaming, then I've yet to see it. <sighs> I don't know. Shining. Ready Player One? Yeah, that kind of feels like I. I, oh, brought well, my I don't remember too clearly. I think that was a video game. I think it was. I think it was. Um, yeah, even like I mean, the opening of Alan Wake Two also made me think of The Shining of just having like the big overhead shots of the car. 
uh, as it's driving through the mm-hmm. woods. Like that's already shining. And then when you get to this, and it's like we gotta get to room six six five and yeah, lady in the away. tub, like all that all the good stuff. Yeah, Leo, I think I'm kind of becoming obsessed with The Shining. Right. I think it's like I think it's a thing. Like you know, you watch the, the compilation of him looking at the camera. What? No. Yeah, Jack Nicholson looks at the camera at several key points oh. in the movie. He does a little glare, little glance right into the lens. Oh, got it. Creepy and cool. Very Man. meta. Very remedy. Very ahead of their time. They did it again. Wow. Remedy you did it again. God <laughs> damn it! I can't believe they directed the Shinings that well. <laughs> Uh, Hanson, Hanson, you're not really reading comments, are you? Your your deepest dive document is just all all work and no play makes Hanson a dull boy, right? <laughs> uh, Gabe B writes in and says, "New plot element: colon the devil goes supremely hard, and it's and plopping it onto my plot board is gonna stick with me the same way press L1 to time travel in Titanfall 2 stuck with me." Yeah, I'm not into devil fiction in a big way, but that was definitely a notable thing. New plot element, the devil. It's like, hell yeah. Let's put the devil into this mix. This sounds great. I it thought the cool. haunted one was kind of useless. The, the haunted one didn't really change that much besides add swirlies to the ground. And Because I went through to make sure that like I didn't miss anything. So I was just adding haunted to every scene. And it really only applied to like one of them. And the rest of them, it looked just like the devil, but with swirlies on the ground and like maybe one other body mm-hmm. on the left or something. I was mm-hmm. like, oh, I, I wish, I wish yeah. they had like given us more here as someone who loves cults and like ritualistic killings. It was weird that we kind of just got like the set pieces of it. Right. I would have like liked not... to see the performance of the play. Yeah, like yeah. I wanted to see the play, the, the performance, like. Yeah, give me nothing. That's Alan. a lot of NPCs talking, though. I don't know if the game has it in it. That's it just felt so hollow. Wow. Their whole theme is like interactive media, like mm-hmm. is a game. But like the closest thing outside of a game is an interactive play. Is like where you're changing the work based on your act- interactivity. So I was like, when that was, when I figured out that's what this section was about, I was like, oh heck yeah, let's watch mm-hmm. the audience get killed because that's what's happening mm-hmm. to me as I play this game. I'm getting killed. It's like, oh, that's so cool. And then it was just Casey being like, so. People died, huh? And I was like, oh, and I realized they weren't going to do that. I was, I was kind of let down. Yeah, that's totally fair. It, the premise is definitely stronger than the, the execution. Well, no. mm-hmm. yeah, and and also like um, the last one with Alan Wake, where he was in like in the subway area and stuff. I felt like using using the different plot elements really changed up the environments a lot and like opened up different pathways. And here's and it, here it felt mostly like. <laughs> set dressing quote unquote i guess like it it added a lot of blood and like some sometimes a hallway would you know like a door would lead to a different door that was locked in the in a different version of it and it just it didn't have the same hit that that the previous like yeah. i really liked that mechanism um in the earlier mm-hmm. chapter and it like the subway screaming bit. imagine if they did yeah. that but the oh. screaming of the audience when they realized mm-hmm. that they're getting killed for the actual yeah, cult that's so weird yeah. how they kind of didn't do that well yeah, yeah. I'm that would have sure. been so cool here for that it i'm sure they wanted so, to like, yeah i bet it's just yeah. a bunch of things tom rickard writes and says it was extremely hard to find a moment to talk about for this chunk of the game. And I think that's because each chapter in this middle chunk felt like it was at peak creativity. For this chapter, though, uh, it's where it felt like story and gameplay came together perfectly. The maze-like structure of the ocean view, the story of the murder, all the slow burn to just the eventual the devil plot element. The overwhelming dread in this section felt like Remedy really nailing what a survival horror game is, even though hours before there was a damn musical section. Any other game would give whiplash, but Alan Wake 2 revels in keeping you on your toes. That's a, that's a great point. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Did yeah. anyone else get mad when they were on the second floor, but they yes. didn't go up any stairs? So it was yes. like very confusing to figure out where you and were. And you have to go through like point. a bathroom but to get to the yeah. different floor, but not the actual stairs. Right, right, yeah. right. Very <laughs> funky. Uh, Mecha Pig says, how do y'all feel about Thomas Zane at this point? Throughout the first game and now the first half of this one, he feels like the character the writers know is important but keep holding back for later. I kept forgetting he existed when he's not actively being referenced on screen. I do like him being a full Euro cinema art trash, bro. Yeah, so mm-hmm. finally get to the room and then you find out who's been calling Alan Wake and it's Thomas Zane and it's the Alan Wake actor but without a beard kind of just doing a Jim Morrison impersonation. <laughs> it really This is our first time seeing Thomas Zane too. We've never seen Thomas Zane. Right. And is it the same voice actor as Alan Wake? It, I think it's the, the voice actor, actor of the actor. Yeah. It's exactly. not it's not 
it's not the Dr. Darling voice guy. It's actually the Alan Wake like face okay. actors okay. voice. Okay, okay, yeah, mm-hmm. okay. That makes sense. That's um, the worst. I don't know their names, so that's <laughs> the only way I could describe it. That, I, the, the, the whole montage of their party sequence was like, maybe, somehow it was like dorkier than the musical sequence. Yeah. You know, it was like the yeah. first time I was like, this I is so they dopey. Were partying. I thought it was cute. No. It, was, it was giving when you were in middle school and pretending out. to be yeah. at a party. You're like, <laughs> pretending <laughs> to be like, drunk. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we're crazy. We're licking the camera lens. We're so high. <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, guys. <laughs> That song got me. It was a little cringier than the the battle rap or or whatever. The I'm a psycho. <laughs> <laughs> that one. It totally. I took me out of it to flash to my friend I know was about to play that game, and I'm like, he's gonna think this is so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a tough tough tone to pull off the party montage, I guess. And it's like it's interesting. I think to for the big mystery of Thomas Zane to finally show him, and it's like. To make it so cheesy instead of mysterious is I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. Like I, I'm all on board for the band. I don't think that's him. I think oh, this really? is, some... is it Thomas Zane Scratch? What I don't know. I don't know if it's Scratch mm. or something. Because we'll just like I don't know. At the end of Alan Wake One, Thomas Zane's in the dark place forever, and the bright presence has taken him over. And the bright presence is just using Thomas Zane to like get around. So now that he's just in a hotel room with Alan hanging out, I'm like, that doesn't. And they're too good at plot and like remembering what they did in the past to not be like, oopsie, we forgot about, or maybe I'm missing a link in the middle. It just doesn't really make sense. So I don't, I, when huh. I saw him, I was like, that's not him. This is a sneaky trick. I don't know. That's interesting. Hmm. Uh, Forrest with two R's writes and says, we could talk about the overlaps and differences between Alan, Zane, and Scratch all day, but the big thing to me is that the Anderson brothers and Ati all call Alan Tom in every interaction, even when they're talking about him to Saga, and that carries more weight when you find out that Zane and Alan have been working on projects together in the Dark Place for a long, long time. You could have entire games over explaining that, uh, just that bit, but I love that this game is content with giving the player something to think on and keep on moving. Or yeah. Thomas Zane wrote Alan into existence, which is the classic theory that they seem to want us to think and maybe they'll pull the rug out and it'll be something else. Yeah. But it seems like they're leading to that in a way. What What's with the uh, the diver stuff? When Alan he, Wake, he's like, oh, the poet, the diver, Thomas Zane, is like he played a diver in a movie? Is that what it was? He dove into the lake to save Barbara and then like they call him the diver and then they put him actually like in a diver suit. So like when you talk to him in Alan Wake 1, he's either like this ethereal light and then they you learn later it's the bright presence, but like it's through Thomas Sane it's talking to you. And then they put him in a diver suit and it's like just a diver suit, but like lights protruding from the mask so you can't see in it. So that's what he's like. That's what they make him look like. Huh, and then they okay. just call him the diver because yeah. he's just in the dark place in the water, I guess. Huh. Cool. Um, let's see. Drake H says, seeing Jesse and Dr. Darling show up on the TV and Zane saying, they're on to us while trying to hide gave me goosebumps. They somehow managed to get me to take the universe seriously during one of the silliest ga- sequences in the entire game. Yeah. Well, the, what's, craziest, what's... the craziest thing was the price of those drinks. Am I right? Twenty five dollars for a cocktail. You want that ocean view that cocktail? That was really the dark place. Yeah, you gotta pay. <laughs> yeah, it that's up. how you know you're really in the dark place. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. That drink better be on fire or something, or be a good Instagram story if it's twenty five dollars. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then, uh, chapter six, uh, return. We're going back to the apartment. Uh, the Alice stuff. This is where you see those emails from Barry about turning Al's story into a frickin' video game. And I like just the amount he complains about Hollywood in there as well. That's always fun and satisfying to see. Um, I like, too, that in the in the red room, uh, the dark room, more specifically, uh, that Alice has, like, one of the photos she has is, like, the game over oh, yeah. screen of Alan, like, ah, 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 on the floor. It's a cool little detail. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Bread writes in and says, the reveal that the horror story playing out in Bright Falls was written by Scratch rather than Alan at the end of this chapter puts the new darker tone of this game into fantastic perspective. This game lacks much of the corny energy of the first game because the story in this case is being written by a psychopathic monster and the hasty looking edits to the manuscript pages that seemed so eerie before have now taken on a comforting new light knowing that it's Alan doing his best he can to weigh the events of a bleak story in favor of the people experiencing it rather than having written all this tragedy and pain himself. 
Imagine if it was a word doc and they're just each in there, like, deleting. <laughs> <laughs> you can see the little, like, little anonymous animal, animal thing, thing in the top. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Steve Bellegarde says, whenever Alan runs into Tim Breaker, the sheriff, there's a really funny tone change in Alan's speech. He's normally like, the darkness was everywhere. I was alone and without hope. Then he runs into Tim at his conspiracy board and he talks to him like he just ran into him at the grocery store. Hey, Tim, so nice to see you here. Yeah. I like that yeah. he pretends to not remember him again. Yeah. You know, because so Tim's like, really he's funny. like, oh, yeah, you've forgotten me before. And then he tries to like play it back again. And he's like, I'm just kidding. I remember you, Tim. <laughs> uh, yeah, Leo, you referenced it, I think, before we started recording, but. Uh, just the Alan Wake face. I feel like so many of the scenes in this game is just him just giving that same yes, slightly. <laughs> no, that absolutely is what it looks yeah. like. I mean, if he nailed that in the audition, he's he's good to go throughout this entire thing. Even the dance scene, I think he was making that face. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's like he's being for- held at gunpoint to dance. Yeah, when he's not being like right. cool, like wearing the sunglasses version of Alan Wake for that little bit, yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, at the end of the sequence, then... Alan's like, oh, I'm going to type and fix the story. Oy, 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 oy. And then Scratch runs in and yeah. shoots him in the head. And that's that entire sequence that Has we've seen. Has he considered seen. like not? I know everyone's giving me like a various amount of reasons for just not writing. But has he considered not writing? Because it says on the wall, don't write. Like, so who wrote that? Now and that people Scratch are, keeps is writing, that wouldn't work. But I guess the first time around, he was just writing to save Alice. And he, I mean, yeah, I guess all the other, the other, like, like the American nightmare and he's loop doing a bad and stuff. Job. Yeah. Like, I mean, wouldn't you want to kind of sneakily get out of there? Would you just be like, I live here now? I don't like, know. Tom had... Zane seems like he's having a fine time. Yeah, he's hanging out with the bright presence just floating forever. <laughs> uh, Infinite Soup and, and people uh, on Twitch, they say that he tried that and that's when Scratch wrote it. That's when Scratch wrote Return. Uh, okay. Sure. There's that. Uh, Fabian has an interesting take. I could see negative people having this take and I support negative people in the world. I'm a negative person sometimes. Hey, we're all negative people. So Fabian, we can't judge We all have our scratch. That's right. Mm -hmm. Fabian writes in and they say, for a game about writing and creativity, most of the creativity seems to be in the non-game parts. All the videos and music pieces have high production values and a lot of the, and add a lot of atmosphere, but there are no real ways to influence the game world or enemies. Since the meta story supposedly supposedly is about art coming true, this makes me feel like there are many missed opportunities to give players more way to approach the game's challenges than just shooting a gun. If you want that kind of gameplay experience, might I interest you in playing Outer Wilds Echoes of the Eye, mm, okay. which very much gives the player that kind of control to play with the theme of what is a video game and the expectations of a video game. So That's if you're looking for so like interesting. more of that like meta perspective on like breaking the rules of the game by playing the game, check that out instead. This is definitely in the guardrails of a video game, and I'm not going to criticize it for, like, being a video game. I was actually thinking that they should play Hitman. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. I was thinking... There's a lot to consider here. Yeah. But I do think... I, think the best game I don't want to be too dismissive. I do think that's an interesting point. It is... I, I do feel, like, it's self-conscious fair. about the medium, I think, yeah. when we're like, this game rules, because it has live-action bits and the music's good <laughs> in between segments. Like, yeah, we, we like those <laughs> formats, too, but we like video games, right? And we're just... You know, but I do think, like, you know, having the loop, having... Being inspired by PT and having all these overlaps be a little loop. Like, there's, there's cool ideas. What isn't ideas. this game inspired by? Oh, my God. <laughs> That's the point, Sarah. That's the Incredible. point. Incredible. Uh, yeah, the overlaying of the FMV on the gameplay. I always expect it to, like snap between more i feel like that's gonna happen at some point it's just gonna snap and you're suddenly gonna be in that scene you're seeing a little glimpse up it's it's a totally fair criticism yeah and i think part of the reason we find it so cool and are so excited by it is because it feels like only this studio is doing it so it's like this is Mm -hmm. this is a a studio's personality we're getting to interact with and that feels rare in games yeah Mm -hmm. yeah unless it's rare uh court says i'm playing the game on playstation 5 and I've never taken advantage of the game help feature until now. I don't care to spend a lot of time figuring out what comes next. And while this isn't an Alan Wake feature, I really appreciate how this can keep me progressing through the storyline. Is anyone else using the game help feature on PS5? No. Is this a game help feature? He, I, so they have little chapter thingies. What do they call them, PS5? I haven't used them for a long time. I used them for like the Sackboy's Big Adventure. Was like the Astrobot thing. <laughs> right, the right. game I played on it. <laughs> but, all right, that seems cool. Um, let's see. Phil Yeatsteak says, here's a nitpick. 
The mirrors in this game are driving me crazy. The reflections are all a blurry mess. Why do they put so many mirrors in this game? Especially in the fitness center at the nursing home. There are mirrors covering the walls. I even tried switching between graphics settings on PS5 and they always look bad. Yeah. Isn't there's like a really interesting video about like how you can do mirrors in video games and doing them well often takes a lot of processing power because you're essentially duplicating the scene on the other side. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, nitpick a video game all you want and like... I don't think it's like Alan Wake's like it's not my game of the year, but I'm not going to comfort its mirrors. <laughs> don't comfort Hitman mirrors. does that perfectly. <laughs> it's such a weird thing to like. It, I mean, yeah, they don't look great, but it's like cut them some slack. <laughs> it is an interesting problem because I bet like in their engine or whatever, it's really hard to do, and mm-hmm. that's why they're like this. But it's so thematic and so consistent yeah. that mirrors are constantly coming up. It's like we have mm-hmm. to have mirrors around. Yeah. I mean, it kind of, this is such a cop out, but it kind of plays into the narrative again. Oh, like, don't do it. Don't are, do it. Are you real or not? I can't no! look at myself. No. <laughs> Thanks, Ailey. Oh. Don't do it. I yes. thought of it that way. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jumpo writes in says, I love how the collectibles have their own set of side stories with conclusions to them all, like little notes in the cult stashes, especially the ones where you have to do math. Where you have to do a maths question. All right, this person's British. Um, and the note inside is really mad about it. Also, would love to know uh, if anyone's been able to hear all of the Pat main radio shows. Yes, yes, yes. Because um, there's, we're bugged out. That's a bummer. They couldn't hear the last three. Um, yeah, the, the math Aww. stuff. Uh, Spencer Boutine says, the most horrifying part of the game thus far was stumbling upon the cult stashes that hid their lock code behind an algebra problem? F me, man. Who remembers how to isolate variables and multivariable algebra equations? My desk looked like Saga's case wall in her mind place by the time I finished writing out solutions on <laughs> sticky notes. <laughs> yeah, I guess the only one I found there is like the one about like the number of cars, uh, number of wheels uh, for the cars versus roller skates. You know, it has a total oh. 273. You know what I'm talking about? That's no. Oh, really? okay. So yeah, it's some it's some math problem there. Um, yeah, so it's like 754 total wheels in a factory. Um, and I am mm, so bad at yeah. math. I felt bad. I'm like, I'm just Googling this. Please forgive me, Remedy, because... Uh, yeah, it was cars versus... Bicycles. Yes, that's what it was. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Did you do it, Jevon? I did it. <gasps> but it, it was trial and error. And I actually did have to get out my phone's calculator oh. and, and do the do actual maths. And is nice. it, did you have a richer experience for doing that? No. Okay. And I, I don't think I got anything good from the stash either. Man, and that's, that's when I stopped doing it. I've kind of so started giving up on the stashes. But once again, starry mode, I feel like they matter less. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, let's see, uh, Joe Kovchinsky says, doing a bunch of collectibles, a saga, and the last rhyme triggered two of those water monsters. It took all my resources to take them down, and I limped back to the lodge with four bullets and no healing items. Inside, I saw a deer at the end of a hallway. It paused, then went into a previously locked room. I followed it, and I found enough resources to leave me fully stocked. I realized that it was a coincidence and that I had petted the last of the mounted deer heads at some time during my excursion, but in that moment it felt like something had reached out and given me just the hand that I needed. Oh, that's nice. Cool. That's beautiful. Uh, Piet van Rasmalen says, I married a Finnish woman, quit bragging, and when her son was born, we named him Ati for his second name. Uh, Some references to Finnish culture that I noticed in this game. There are, oh, forgive me, Karjalana Paraka pastry is at Ati's show. It's a typical pastry with rice, uh, with rice and an optional egg salad. It's very dry and I don't like it, but it was there and watery. <laughs> uh, Ilmo says uh, that his sauna invi- invite email to bring condiments to the sauna. It's common to drink beer and sometimes grill a sausage in the sauna. Uh, in the well loop, you see a glimpse of people dancing the Finnish tango. This is not at all similar to the Argentinian tango. Yeah, I remember, I, we didn't really talk about that, yeah, but there's like the glimpses of like the group dancing out in the woods. That's so cool. Uh, by the way, do you know what the Dreamcast logo is doing on that door in the old folks' home? <laughs> <laughs> of course we do. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, Ravgo says, the music in this game is so incredible. From the score to the old gods of Asgard to the end of chapter songs, combined it feels like anything... Beyond, beyond anything I've heard in a game. My personal favorite is This Road, which plays at the end of each of Alan's chapters. An interesting thing about this is that it's by Poe, who's a singer-songwriter whose career grinded to a halt after the rights to her own music got entangled in some ugly legal mess in the early 2000s. This wow. song, which is a collaboration with Sam Lake, seems to be the first thing she's released under her own name since then. Wow. Yeah, that's a cool wow. backstory. I love it. Um, let's see... 
Anthony Brown says, I haven't finished much, much of this section of the game, but my future prediction for myself when I listen to this is that Saga's profiling ability is her connecting with Scratch somehow. Ooh. Interesting. What? Uh, Mayor Setter okay. fan says, just who is Mayor Setter? Let's look at all the evidence we have. Mayor Setter <laughs> won't roll over on the issues. When you ask, Mayor Setter will speak. Mayor Setter is afraid of the rough questions. Then there's the name, Setter. When I tracked him down in Watery, and after patting him on the head, I told him he's a very good mayor. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. <laughs> so he's a dog? I think that's what they're going for. I think that's the idea. I was wondering the entire time because they it always pops up as like, this is an investigation note. And it's like, mm. oh, when's this mayor going to show up? And what's... What's the mayor into? I did not realize it was <laughs> just a that. dog somewhere. I think it's the mayor of the dog. Uh, let's see. Chris Houston. So he got turned into a Was that an AWE? Got, it's an AWE. Like, that was, that was the second the one. Dog? The second one that they fixed, yeah. They fixed it just by making a mayor and then everyone was cool. Right. Um, Chris Houston says, while mystery slash metafiction are innately confusing. Well, hang on. Before I even read this. Have, have we missed anything in the chapters? Does anybody have something they're dying to talk about? So I'll remember it later. Yeah. I really like the um the animation, the dark tunnel animation of like going between characters. I think that's incredibly well done. I think it's like weirdly long and loud. Yeah. Do you Sorry. know what it's like to transfer I'm taking another person? Old person opinion on that? It's a new loud <laughs> wow. in this tunnel. Freaking go to Valhalla <laughs> and die already, Sarah Christ. <laughs> um Oh, we never talked about why Norman never taken is always wearing a towel. Oh yeah. Norman towel. Um, is he, is this, he's always wearing a towel? I've yeah. never seen him not in a towel. I guess. That's just kind of his defining characteristic. That's fun. Uh, let's see. Chris Houston does write in then. And they say, well, mystery slash metafiction are innately confusing. I'm afraid of how Remedy is going to end it. This game has answered a lot of questions. And while it doesn't have to answer all of them, a part of me feels like the answers we do get are too convenient slash not dwelled on long enough. Things like Saga being a seer are plainly laid out to us, which is fine and essential to telling a story. But the fact that they keep building and how meta it is makes me debate whether it's clever or just lampshading. Haley, how are you feeling about how this thing's going to stick the landing or slip on it in a tub and drown? <laughs> They'll probably do what they did with Alan Wake 1, which is which is Alan Wake 3 will quickly answer all the questions we have about Alan Wake 2 <laughs> and then give us a whole new set of questions to worry about. <laughs> because that's what they did. It's like they they were like, this is what happened with Alan. And you're like, oh my God. And like, also... <laughs> Who's Saga? You're like, I don't know. And now I just don't care about all the things I used to be confused about. <laughs> things are way more complicated now. And that's just kind of that type of media, right? Like you get that little quick satisfaction. Like I knew it. Yeah. Ha ha. And then there's something more interesting to care about. Like that's probably the easiest way to keep it going. But eventually, yeah, I mean, they're going to have to finish this. Like how does this finish? Finish? Um, Wait a minute. Auntie. Wait a minute. Remedy. Yeah. Auntie? But I don't know. I think they're handling it up to this point. I'm, I'm trusting them and I feel fine about what they're doing with it. And it's not still not too much. And it's still mm -hmm. hitting me in the same way that first Dr. Door or Mr. Door thing hit me where I'm like, oh, my God, what are they doing? I love it. It's still doing that for me. But it is about sticking the landing. Right. So yeah. I'm curious mm -hmm. to see how this finishes. Yeah. Any any big predictions for anybody for the final chunk? I, I hope, hope Thomas Sane isn't writing this whole time. I hope it's not that. It might be. Okay. Because, But I think they're almost kind of making it so obvious that it's that, that makes me think it's not that, you know? And Sarah wants Alan to die. I mean, he's kind of, he's kind of already dead, you know, like the dark place. Like it's, he's kind of stuck. Like he's going to come to the real world and then mm -hmm. just be murdered. That's what you want, Sarah? Yeah, but I wish he could just like cease to exist. He's done enough. Uh, he's I mean, meddled enough. He's okay. ruined enough lives. Sure, sure, What do you sure, want sure. for Saga? Want her to live happily with her daughter and Tor and Odin in Bright Falls. Yeah, I want them to lean with a little. Whoever bit. her husband David is. Yeah, I, I hope wonder if there's something going on there. I hope he's to handsome. Be um, yeah, I, I hope they lean more into the Norse mythology stuff. You know, I think mm -hmm. it's I think it's fun. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know if I want Saga to have a moment at the end of like I'm all powerful, bah! like rising up and flying through the forest or whatever, but. Jeff, who's the final boss? Oh. What does it look like? Probably some version of Scratch again. 
Just bigger I super scratch. I, I honestly, I I wouldn't hate it if it was Thomas Zane the entire time, just because I like the idea of having a series named after a main character that you then learn actually he was a he was a figment of this other person's imagination the entire time who's right. been stuck there the entire time and everything that you've experienced is actually this other character trying to rewrite basically doing what Alan Wake is doing but he's through him he's just a yeah he's just a variation of it that that wouldn't disappoint me i guess yeah mm-hmm. but i also hate alan wake so okay you know. love hate which again you're supposed to so like, that's good. you know like like yeah honestly i we, i didn't i we didn't really loop around to that but like i don't think he's i don't think he's written poorly i think i think like you i don't think you're supposed to have a great impression of who alan wake is as a character and and the fact that like all of us kind of have come to this conclusion that he seems a little selfish for everything that he's doing here. Like, I don't yeah. think that's, um, you know, like I don't think Sam Lake's sitting in it with his head in his hands thinking like, Oh my God, people don't understand this character. He's supposed to be, you know, this great cool. hero or anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I got, <laughs> would you be, would you be mad Jeff? Um, if the last boss was Sam Lake's head, if they went that <laughs> way, I like Andros 10 out of 10. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, Leo, do you got any hopes and dreams for the last third? Um, I definitely don't want too many questions answered. I I always prefer having things left to think on, you know. I don't care too much about closing the book on every little thing. And I but I do hope there are some some big surprises still in store. <laughs> God, you should be a journalist, man. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Sarah, I'd like to apologize for starting the episode when you spill on yourself. I didn't know if you really wanted me to, to restart it. It like it seemed like it wasn't. Well, that I was bad. hoping I would. I could get like a napkin or something, but we were rolling. Yeah, I was like, maybe maybe we could cut it, and then no one would know my shame that I can't drink out of a can. I saw. I made the like you in selfishly the did with the uh, whatever you were wrong about. I can't even remember. <laughs> That's right, because I cut it from your freaking mind as well. Because when I edit yeah. so deep as you dive, rewrote it, Ben will I'm, cut. I'm forgetting. I'm forgetting only his own embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ben only cuts it when he looks bad. Hey everybody! Patreon. I seem to remember having a really good point last episode. I don't remember that. I don't don't remember that at all. Wait, Uh, I had one more question. Do you guys think the cult of the tree is evil? No. I thought it was clarified that they were the good guys. Yeah, well, there's more to them for sure. The way they're always like, "Let us do our thing," but they're being, you know, too obtuse about it. And their thing is cutting people open and shoving the clicker into the chest. That was only taken. That was only taken. They were only hurting taken, and like people scratch was sending to the surface. I so, don't know. So yeah, I think, I, I think they're I, all good. Bilbo intentions. and Yako are in the cult of the tree. I'm in the cult of the tree. Yep, I'm pro cult of the tree. They scared the bejeebus yep. out of the bookers, so that's one naughty thing. <laughs> well, they're not, don't go into the woods. You know, <laughs> they're trying to start a personal brand of don't go into the woods. The cult of the tree is there. That's it. Uh, huge thank you to everybody who is playing along. I'm so thankful that no one's spoiled things in a big way yet uh, to the hundreds of people submitting comments over there on Patreon. We can't thank you enough. Uh, I would read all of your names again right now if I hadn't deleted in this Google Doc as I went along, but you all are, are making this whole thing possible. Uh, we would be so foolish and stupid without you. So thank you for truly making this the best, most thorough discussion about Alan Wake 2 on the internet. Couldn't do it without you, literally, by submitting these comments and then doubly literally uh, by supporting us on Patreon. So if you've watched this on YouTube, thank you. You made it this far. Thank you. Uh, if you enjoy this type of content, please help support it because it's a foolish thing to do to spend this much time talking about a game. So again, you can go to patreon.com slash binmax with two ends just as a tip jar, or you can do that to submit a comment on the last chunk of Alan Wake 2 because we are collecting your comments on Sunday. November 19th, and that's going to be for the whole kit and caboodle. That's everything else in Alan Wake 2, and also you can unlock the podcast version of all the Deepest Dives or previous Deepest Dives. We've done 27 of these things, I think, so far, so they're all in that bonus podcast wow. feed, so you could, wow. you could drive around the freaking world listening to these Deepest Dives if you really want to. Uh, hey, that's it. Anybody else got any wise things to say? Um, sorry for razzing, yes, people who wrote comments, you know, uh, I do appreciate every single person who wrote in, and you're allowed to not like it for sure. We do want to hear your perspective. <laughs> Very yeah. true. You're not allowed to not like the musical, though. Yeah. I, I yeah, do want to make that clear. We draw the line there. If you don't like the musical, be serious, first off. Do do some <laughs> internal work and come back and then leave a comment. That's all I ask. 
<laughs> All right. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you next week for the grand finale of The Deepest Dive. It's a fun ride. Thanks to you. Bye, everybody. Oh, I should have said we return next week. Right? Oh. Oh. Return. oh, do you want to re-record that now and then edit it in? Yeah, let's take it from the top. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. Uh, we return next week. <laughs> you can't see it, but Jeff was laughing. He's laughing. Okay, That's bye, right. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you can help support independent games media by subscribing to Mimnax on YouTube here, or you can support us over on Patreon to unlock a weekly Patreon exclusive podcast called Party Chat. You can call into our podcast. You can put a picture of your choice on every Mimnax video. Mimnax is a Patreon about games, friends are getting better, and we exist because of you. Any help telling a friend's appreciated.